Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome back to those of you who joined us this morning, and welcome to, to those of you that are new and, and just joining us for the first time today. My name is Dean Lees, and I'm on the sales uh, engineering and marketing team at Buckley Associates. Uh, joining me here to present is Nathan Vaughn, product application engineer, Chris Burrows, product manager of Stratified Air Systems. And we also have a guest speaker for this afternoon, uh, John Swift, principal and partner at Burrow Happold. Uh, those of you that were with us this morning kind of heard me talk about uh, this, you know, holistic approach that we're taking, the, the system design approach that we're looking at for chilled beams today and uh you know looking at the entire system as a whole and design considerations that go into looking at these systems and and uh this morning we spent a lot of time on the chilled beams themselves how to select them certain design parameters that we want to watch out for and uh doing all of that with the, uh, with the hopes of kind of demystifying these systems that, that can sometimes be intimidating to, to people that haven't designed them before. And, uh, you know, hopefully presenting some, some material uh, in, in a new way and uh, giving people new ways to think about uh, these systems when they're designing them. Uh, to, to follow along with that conversation, we're, we're gonna have a couple more broad discussions this afternoon around uh you know what to what to look for when you're selling these types of systems to an end user to a building owner um to a building tenant uh the you know um john will get into this in his presentation a little later and and you know what types of considerations go into that and and how to talk about these systems um, as well as some some items to look out for when uh, when troubleshooting in the field and, and balancing systems and, and really commissioning these systems and, and bringing a building online. Uh, so this is more of a, of a broad discussion this afternoon to kind of think about these uh, the overall approach to chilled beams and uh, and the system. So. Um, you know, with that, I'll, I'll hand things over to Nathan to get going. And, uh, and you know, again, we do have a lot of people here on the line. Everyone will remain muted for the duration of this session. But if any questions do come up, if you want us to spend a little more time on a particular topic, just use the question function in your GoToWebinar toolbar. Uh, type in your question uh, or let us know you know anything that you might be running into that you think might be helpful to share with the group um, if you want us to spend more time on a certain subject just uh, don't be shy reach out um, and and use that question function to uh, to communicate with us here there's there's five of us in the room here that are experts in chilled beam systems and and we're happy to answer those questions as they come up uh, so Nathan you want to get going all right, thanks, Dean. Let's uh, back up to the first slide of the Beams presentation, and we'll start off with some conversations about uh, about balancing these these types of systems. So back up a little bit. So just to cover our our agenda for for this afternoon session, uh, we're going to start with the balancing of chilled beams and uh, kind of talk about why it's different from a more Traditional system you may be familiar with. If, if you haven't uh, actually worked on one of these these projects, um, there are some challenges with balancing. So we'll talk about those Ill issues that we see come up uh, more often as well. <clears throat> and then uh, last discussion on the, the balancing and installation side of things, we did a quick test um, in our lab to to try to replicate some of those issues that we see fairly often on these uh, these commission systems or systems in the test and balance phase. And uh, we'll share with you some of the results that we, we saw in our lab uh, in, in optimal conditions. And then from there, we'll jump into some narrative and early stage design uh, content. How do you handle one of these systems from a very, uh, a very infantile stage? And what's, uh, what's important from that first, the first couple of decisions you're going to make in the, in the system? 
then we'll dig a little bit deeper into the airside design, what, uh, what's actually important, and how to, to avoid some, some pitfalls that you may encounter, and then we'll get into the water system as well, um, starting at the zone level uh, near the, the beams themselves, and then backing up a little bit to the system. And uh, just talk about some options you have and uh, things to consider when you are designing these. Um, and as Dean mentioned, we do have a chat feature and some questions, so we'll be monitoring those throughout the presentation. So feel free to um, throw some questions in there if, uh, if you want to dig deeper into something. We're happy to to pause and, and uh, chase down your questions. Um, uh, so feel free to, to go in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, what about it? Oh, and uh, we will talk about the six-way valve um, as well. We got a question about the six-way valve, but that that'll be there in the water side section. So we'll we'll cover some uh, some topics on that as well. So uh, jumping into the the air side balancing, my clicker wants to to work with me here. Um, so tubings are a little bit different from a uh, VAV system. So um, we don't actually see a lot of water side issues. Uh, so most most of the issues we're going to be talking about today are on the air side of things. Um, so we'll we'll kind of uh, leave some of the water side balancing, the circuit side, and that conversation to the side for now. That uh, does not come up quite as often as as balancing the air side of things. Uh, and the first thing we want to point out is is flow hoods are typically not a great idea for chilled beams for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first being that the the beams are kind of different sizes. They're not a two by two in most cases. We do have some options for that size. But if you get a six foot or a 10 foot beam, a lot of times it's gonna be a challenge to fit a flow hood over that. Um, and the second issue that we see is uh, you actually have a bi-directional airflow um, and what you're trying to read. So you have some air coming downwards and upwards and now you're gonna have some turbulence inside that uh, the area where you're trying to read that, that pressure differential on that flow sensor. So it's you're not gonna get a very consistent or accurate reading. Um, so we typically avoid using those flow hoods to, to try to balance chilled beams. Um, so that said, uh, you know, what are your, the rest of the tools you're going to use to balance these? Um, which is a fair question if you haven't seen a system like this. So uh, what we typically recommend is having, uh, we always have a pressure port. So, so every beam is going to have either a tube hanging down uh, or this uh, pressure port shown here in the, the brass on the bottom side, uh, bottom left of this picture. And you'll connect a tube, a uh, manometer, a short ridge manometer, whatever manometer you're going to be using to that tube and measure the static pressure within the pressure vessel of the chilled beam. Um, so that's what we're looking for. We want to see that pressure. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have a, a chart on each chilled beam. So we're going to look through that chart um, as shown here in this, this next slide. So you'll, you'll read that. Uh, in this example, we have a 0.35 inches of static that we're reading from, um, from that balancing port. So we're going to trace that over to the correct nozzle size and uh, trace that uh, once we find our nozzle curve. Uh, each one of these curves is going to be a different nozzle. And it could have very different flow characteristics, uh, even though the beams may look the same. Um, so we'll find that correct curve and trace that down to your CFM. So it is like a one step removed process. Um, so you're not going to directly measure the CFM. You do have to go look at that pressure and, uh, and see what we've, we've correlated that to on this chart. Um, so a little bit different from a typical system. Uh, and we'll talk about some, some more pitfalls a little bit later on as well. Um, but one thing I'd like to point out before we, we get to those items is uh, um, what we're looking at here is different uh, curves of capacity uh, per CFM at different nozzles. So each one of these lines is a different nozzle size. And uh, what you'll notice is that the left side is very steep. Uh, it's also not as long of a, of a line. Um, so what that means is the effective operating range of how much CFM you can put through this, this nozzle size is smaller. And uh, at the larger the nozzle size grows, uh, essentially the less back pressure um, we, we see in that, that nozzle, uh, the more range of airflow we can put through it. Um, so for example, on the left side, uh, we're looking at a couple CFM per foot. Uh, if we increase that maybe five or six CFM per foot, we're getting a couple hundred BTU swing. Uh, compare that to the, the nozzle size on the right, uh, the flattest curve here, or the, the shortest slope, um, we're going to see a 20 CFM curve for a very similar 200, 300, uh, I guess more than 400 BTU swing. Um, so that, that larger nozzle size is going to see a much smaller swing per CFM than the smaller nozzles will. Um, so this means that if you're balancing the chill beam and you have a smaller nozzle size, your 5 CFM off, you're going to see a much larger uh, decrease in capacity than you would at the larger nozzle size. Um, so essentially, there's the larger nozzle size are a little more forgiving, um, but really the point here is that uh, with chill beams, a few CFM can change the capacity quite a bit. Uh, and that's because, as we mentioned in the morning session, 
there is an induction factor. So every CFME supply is going to be multiplied by the amount of uh, CFM that are induced through the water coil. So you lose a couple CFM, and you're actually going to lose a, a lot more than that through the induction process. Uh, if, you, if you're having some leakage or you're just not quite getting to the right pressures in that chill beam. So uh, each, each beam project is going to have some performance submitted. We typically characterize these beams uh, per beam. Uh, sometimes you'll have multiples of the same tag in each zone, but uh, generally each beam is going to have its own performance run, uh, which will be submitted and approved by the engineer in, in a, every, almost every project. Um, if not, we can find it. If you have a beam that you don't know the, the performance of it, we can look back and find that uh, through our records as well. But uh, you're going to want to look through this sheet to try to find the correct uh, nozzle size, make sure you have the right beam, the right length, um, and then you know what airflow you're expecting and what pressure you're actually going to see at that airflow. So you can look back to our schedules uh, to find that information. Um, you're typically looking for something like this. The, you've got the primary airflow to the left of that green circle and the primary air pressure, which is uh, the more important and direct way to measure um, the, the balancing curves of these chill beams. So you're going to find that variable. Um, for your correct tag, make sure you get the right nozzle size, the right CFM, and the right length, just to make sure you get the right uh, beam. So all four of these characteristics uh, are very important in making sure you have the right beam in the right place, and you're going to get the right airflow through that to get the, the capacity that room needs. There's also a couple different methods to, uh, to trim the CFMs on these guys, uh, these chill beams, active chill beams. Um, we do recommend having these wherever possible. Uh, at times, you can try to self-balance without a, a damper upstream, but it can be pretty difficult, and uh, you don't really have a lot of flexibility to uh, to change that on, on site if you do need to balance uh, the beams after they're installed. Um, so the manual quadrant damper shown here is, is one option that we see pretty often. Uh, we'd like to have some straight duct run uh, downstream between that and the beam whenever possible, uh, but we do like to see this, uh, this variant of a, of a balancing damper and also one we see pretty regularly is the auto flow regulator here, um, which will essentially self-balance uh, within a given pro uh, pressure range. Um, so between 0.2 inches and 0.8 inches of static, we find this holds the CFM um, fairly regularly. So you, you can see that in this chart here. Um, going up below the 0.2 inches of static, it's a pretty steep curve. And then it really flattens out between 0.2 and 0.8, uh, which is exactly the operating range that we're going to see in most beams. Um, you will notice also that uh, the, the highest CFM we see on this chart is about 175, um, which is also pretty close to the limits of the chill beam. We can see a few, maybe 100 CFM more than that, but um, most selections are going to be between maybe 50 CFM and, uh, and 200 CFM. Um, so it's fairly close to our, our consistent range of uh, CFMs we see. So another good product to, to use whenever balancing. Make sure you're getting the right CFMs all the way to the end of your duct run. And the next, uh, just talking about some standards the industry is uh, kind of uh, using. We started with the Nortest method, it's a European standard from several years ago. Uh, eventually, they moved on to the EN standard, the 15116 there. And you'll see that a couple more data points were added. Um, so the pr uh, primary airflow pressure drop and also the airflow rate uh, were added. Uh, but what you'll see in the ASHRAE 200, which is the most recent standard uh, that America, North America has adopted, uh, is we've almost doubled the amount of data points that we collect um, so this has been great for the industry to kind of standardize in a way to capture data, what data is going to be captured, and then also how do we get it. So we, we're comparing apples to apples if you are actually 200, if you're testing that, that method of tests. Um, so a couple points here that are pretty important are the induction ratio, uh, the total sensible cooling capacity, so the beam as it's installed, and not just uh, the coil capacity plus the air side. Um, so we're actually testing it as, a, as it would be installed. And also the sensible water. Uh, per, per volume of primary air. So there's a few different data points that are, are pretty important to really characterize the beam and, and know it's, it's accurate and the data we publish is going to be what you see on site. Uh, we do have our own hydraulic test chamber. Uh, you saw a picture that Chris mentioned earlier. Uh, this chamber is able to do a few different standards, uh, both for chilled beams and radiant panels, uh, and then actually also passive chilled beams. Um, so this is a six wall calorimeter chamber. Uh, it's, a, it's a very lengthy test. It's fully automated, so we can put a beam in there and basically hit, hit run, and it's going to do all the thinking for us. We've, uh, we've automated the whole process. Um, so it's a pretty cool chamber, and it's, it's, we find it to be pretty accurate. Um, and we test one beam at a time, so it takes a while to characterize all these beams and, and get all that data uh, so that we can publish that data in our, our uh, selection software. 
and kind of talking about how we how we get that those readings and how we know they're accurate. Uh, we're using some more accurate uh, technologies than you would see in the field. They're just not really affordable technologies. Uh, so actually, 200 allow or requires us to measure the airflow within plus or minus five percent um, the airflow, and then the plenum pressure within 0.01 percent uh, inches water gauge, and then also, we, we tested all the ductwork to make sure that it's sealed the smack in class A, so no leakage at all. Uh, we're not losing any airflow. It's very it's a much shorter uh, run of duct than you would see on the field. So kind of an ideal scenario for what we're trying to, to accomplish here and very accurate. Um, as I mentioned before, you're using a, a traverse or a manometer in the field. Um, in the, the lab, we're actually using orifice plates, which are uh, one of the most accurate ways to calibrate CFM and airflow, even down to low airflows. Um, it's still pretty difficult, 20 CFM or lower, to be accurate. So uh, at times, we actually do go that low. Uh, so we want to be as accurate as possible, and that, that's why we're using orifice plates. Um, so you, this uses a high-pressure drop, too, uh, to make sure you, you know exactly what CFM you've got. Um, and it's actually kind of a pain to change them out if you have a different CFM coming through. So it's a pretty involved process, which is why it's not ideal for the field. Um, this would be quite uh, an experience to go through the field and balance with these things. Um, so the traverse can be better in those scenarios, but for the lab situation, this is what we want to start with, and uh, this is how we get our accurate test data for, for characterizing our chilled beams. So just looking at the pitot tube real quick, we see this very often in the field. Um, this is one of the primary devices we, we've seen used uh, for people balancing. Um, we really do recommend the pressure method of, uh, of balancing chilled beams, um, but if you have to go uh, this route and see the traverse, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, we see this used pretty often, but uh, we want to kind of stress that below 500 feet per minute in the duct, this may not be that accurate. Uh, some other issues, if you're slightly off of the uh, parallel, being parallel to the velocity in the in the duct, you may uh, lose some accuracy there as well. Um, this is a very accurate uh, pressure manometer transducer there, so um, you're, you're pretty accurate on the pressure reading. Uh, but the problem is you can be off a little bit in that. The axis, if you're not aligned, if you're a couple of degrees off, you're going to see a huge drop in, in accuracy. Um, so it's very sensitive to orientation. And uh, also at low airflows, again, the, the below, below 100 CFM uh, in a six inch duct, you may not be very accurate. So that's why we we'll really want to uh, use the pressure um, as opposed to the traverse. Uh, just to, to kind of follow up on that point, typically you want to stay between 600 and 900 feet per minute. Um, so a six-inch ductwork, that's going to leave you between 120 CFM and 180 CFM. So that's kind of the range you're going to need to stay in at a six-inch uh, inlet. Um, so to compare that to many, many selections that we see with chilled beams, it could be down to 50 CFM through that six-inch ductwork. So you're going to be well below the 500 feet per minute that you want to see. So it's, uh, it can be pretty difficult to get an accurate reading with that traverse. Uh, and then compare that to an eight-inch inlet if you're using a larger, uh, larger chilled beam. You're going to want to be between 200 CFM and 315. Um, so we're kind of getting to the higher ranges of what's uh, what's actually recommended with chilled beams. And then the 10-inch inlet, 320 to 500, uh, is pretty high. Uh, we rarely see CFMs over 300 with chilled beams. Um, so with a 10-inch inlet, it's going to be very difficult to get that that right feet per minute that you want to see um, to use that traverse. So there's just some reasons to to kind of steer you towards using the pressure method of balancing and uh, try to avoid that traverse when possible. It's not always going to be the case, but uh, or achievable. But um, we we really want to rely on that pressure method uh, and not use traverses to to balance these beams or flow hoods as well. So another example, a similar point to make, but uh, using 100 cfm, just looking at different inlet sizes, uh, we're we're okay in the five inch and the six inch here. Six inch is kind of our border, but once we go up to an eight inch inlet at 100 cfm. Uh, maybe the, the noise levels are driving us to a larger inlet size, or this is what you have in the field, and that's what you're stuck with. Uh, but we're well below that 500 feet per minute um, at 100 CFM at an 8-inch inlet. Uh, another example, um, now going up to 150 CFM where we're at, uh, we're still good on both the 5- and the 6-inch inlet. We're getting close in the 8-inch, but we're still not there. Um, you really have to go up to 200 CFM at that 8-inch inlet uh, to get to the, the feet per minute you want. And uh, here at the five inch uh, inlet, you're actually probably a little too high. Um, so you may have some noise issues with that, that scenario and you would need to go higher. So there's a balance between um, getting the right velocity to be accurate and also balancing the noise that that would generate. Um, and uh, typically with chilled beams, we'll see some very low velocities. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind as you balance these, these systems. And uh, I'll cover a few more issues that we see as well. Uh, but just uh, I'd like to give the heads up that this may uh, be a problem that does come up 
And uh, most systems we do balance okay, and we don't have a lot of hot cold complaints. Um, but this is a, a common recur reoccurring issue that we see. So uh, kind of diving a little bit deeper into this, uh, we'll go through a few balancing issues that we see. And I, I think we got a question. Uh, actually, uh, this is Ed. Um, I do want to point out regarding um, flow regulators. Um, there should be uh, a level of um, caution here when using a flow regulator. Uh, when you are using a flow regulator, make sure you look at what the error is on the flow regulators. So a lot of flow regulators that are out there are either a plus or minus five or plus or minus 10% of the total flow of the size of the regulator you're using. So if, if you've got 50 or 60 CFM of primary year and you have a 10% error rate associated to that, that could be pretty significant on your primary air. And once again, as we get into balancing, we're going to see that that 10% could be a pretty big deal on top of the error that you'd take on the sheet work on the sheet metal side of this. So once again, a little caution in using flow regulates. Just uh, make sure you uh, look at what the error rate is and understand whether it's just on the actual value or on the total range because um, it, it, it makes a big difference. So that's a good, good point, Ed. Thanks for uh, commenting there. So uh, I'm actually going to lead into that point in a few slides here as well. We'll talk about that again a couple more times. But the uh, first point I want to make when you, when you do start balancing is that uh, you could have two identical beams from the floor side, um, but the internal components are actually very different. <clears throat> so in this case, we have two beams shown. Uh, one's a nozzle size 406, and one's a 604. Um, so it also sounds uh, very similar, um, but they actually could be very different uh, performance characteristics. Uh, so if you mix these up and you try to balance them as the other one, um, you're not going to get the right pressures. And uh, there's a couple of reasons to, to kind of catch that, but um, that's one thing we see every now and then is people grab the wrong beam, maybe just uh, read the tag backwards and uh, put it in the wrong room. Um, that could cause some pretty serious balancing issues. So do make sure you, you tag them in a way that uh, the installers can figure it out and, and get it to the right place. Um, so if you do have an issue, maybe you're, uh, you, you've got the wrong nozzle size, what we'll see is if you have a smaller nozzle size, you're going to put the right CFM through that, and you're going to see a much higher pressure than you should. You're going to be above the curve. Um, so alternatively, if you have a larger nozzle size than you, you needed, um, you're going to be below the curve. So you'll, have a, you'll get the right uh, CFM through this, but you'll get the, a lower static pressure than you should have. So that's one potential issue that we would see in some job sites where they they've mix up the beams uh, and get the wrong tag in the wrong location. Um, the next issue we see, and I think this is, is a little, little more common than we would expect or typically, is uh, some duct leakage. And um, at times, and I'll talk about this in a, in a few slides as well, uh, it could be allowable duct leakage that gets you out of your tolerance. Um, so you're, you're within your smacking spec, but you're still seeing some leakage. And that can be enough to throw off the reading of the chill beam. Um, that and also pressure um, added pressure drops that maybe you didn't expect in the duct run, so maybe there's just not enough static in the system, which I'll, I'll talk about that in a few more slides as well again. But uh, often we see some leakage at the inlets of the chill beams, maybe just a couple CFM. Uh, but if you have a 25 CFM uh, primary airflow rate to the beams, that's a pretty large percentage already. Uh, and then also any kind of connections, any kind of takeoffs, uh, be careful with those spaces. Um, also, uh, the, any kind of flex duct, uh, if, if it's punctured, it might have some leakage there. Uh, with chill beams, they are a higher pressure system, so you're going to see more leakage just because of that pressure. Um, it's kind of the nature of the beast with, uh, with this type of system. Um, so I mentioned earlier that, that you've got to make sure you can overcome your pressure in the ductwork. So you've got a lot of restrictions. You have that MQ damper, the American, the, that uh, volume flow regular later as well. Those can add some pressure drop in the system. So if you haven't accounted for that and you're, you're static in the system, um, you may not be able to get that, that pressure all the way to the end of the duct run. Um, so if you're not getting that pressure at the DAV, there's no way you're going to get it downstream. Um, so that, that can be one issue as well. Just the system static is not quite high enough to get the pressure all the way to the end of the beam. Um, so if you have a, a 0.8 inches of static that's required on, on the farthest beam from the air handler, that can, uh, that can be a challenge to, uh, to get that beam to balance uh, just because you don't have the right system static. Um, Nathan, Matt has another question. Yeah, go for it. Um, how does um, oversized duct work have an effect on on this balancing piece 
So the oversized ductwork, what's going to happen is if you have too large of a diameter, is uh, the fiber min is going to drop. So you're going to have a, a, a lower velocity in that ductwork, and that's going to make taking a traverse a little more difficult. You're probably going to see more noise in that traverse, and uh, what we found with those traverses, if you have a lot of noise, uh, we tend to, to read the higher numbers and maybe be a little bit, bit generous with the CFM. Um, so we'll see that reading be a little bit higher than, than maybe the average of what that noise is actually going to be. It's just, it's just very difficult to be accurate when you have a lot of fluctuation in that, uh, that velocity reading. Um, so it can be a challenge. Uh, that's why we recommend using the pressure to, to balance instead. Uh, another question from Matt. Um, how many beams on a trunk typically should we use as a rule of thumb? So what, what I've seen, uh, there's no hard rule, there's no max number, um, but we've seen that one to two beams balance pretty accurately, and once you start getting more beams, it may be a little bit less accurate. You have more takeoffs, you have more things uh, and bends in the ductwork, that can add some challenges and some duct losses. Um, so we found it's four to six beams, you're gonna start losing some of that, that um, air, you're gonna have more air building into that. Um, so the more beams you have, the harder it's gonna be to make sure each sees the right amount of CFM, so just keep that in mind. But there's uh, there's no hard rule to, to not make it work. You can make as many beams as you want to work, but there's gonna be some uh, challenges associated with it. So, um, great answer. I, I do have something to add to that. Um, I recently was on a job where they had 12 beams associated to one trunk. And a couple things came out of that after we went out and visited the job. Uh, one was uh, all the beams weren't the same size. So um, I would be cautioned, I would caution you to make sure that if you're gonna put multiple beams on the same trunk, that you set them up in a way that the last beam has enough air and any of the beams in there have enough air. Uh, and then the second piece would be on this particular case, we found that after the fifth beam, we really had no control whatsoever. Um, and this was actually on another trunk where they had multiple beams. I think there was nine beams on this trunk um, and they were all the same size and all the same flows. Um, but after the fifth beam, we no longer could, uh, could balance it. So be cautious on uh, how many beams you put on a trunk. Yeah, great point. So uh, I guess if I had to make one recommendation, it would be try to keep it minimal. Um, there's gonna be scenarios where you can't do that. So obviously sometimes it's going to, you're gonna be um, stuck with four to six or more beams on a trunk, but uh, wherever possible, uh, try to keep fewer beams off of one VAB. Um, so great, great questions there as well. Uh, another thing to consider is your leakage class of the duct and uh, maybe specify an actual class uh, to make sure you can keep that ductwork tight and uh, do some testing. Um, one thing we see is the, the ductwork upstream of the VAV is pressure tested, whereas the ducts, the ducts south, south of the VAVs are not tested as thoroughly or at all. Um, so that's where you're going to see some of that leakage uh, and more flex duct as well, potential for punctures. Um, so consider using a, a leakage class to uh, kind of ensure that you're not gonna to have too much leakage south of the VAV. Um, just because that's gonna really impact the beams, you're gonna lose that pressure. Uh, it's gonna be a challenge to balance the system. Um, so that's something we like to kind of bring up and educate on before we start designing projects to, to try to avoid um, issues down once the, the beams are installed. Um, the next thing, that there's a couple of sealed classes as well. So we just talked about the leakage classes. Uh, we do recommend upgrading your sealed class if you can, if it's economical. Um, and try to, to bump, bump your, uh, your ductwork up a class just to make sure you're losing less. Um, there's also some duct sealers and some other options you can use. Uh, but leakage can be a huge issue. Uh, even though it's, it's within SMACNA or recommended standard leakage levels, it can still cause some problems. Um, you will have some leakage, but uh, keep that in mind when you size your air handlers and your ducts. Um, just know that it's going, to, it's going to be there and maybe oversize just a little bit to, to make up for that. Um, so let's look at another example. It's comparing a typical VAV Square plaque diffuser to a chilled beam. In this case, we've got a two by two foot, six inch inlet SPD, uh, square plaque diffuser. Um, we're gonna put 100 CFM through that with a six inch inlet. Um, uh, similar thing on the chilled beam, 100 CFM. Uh, but we're uh, six foot chilled beam with a 604 nozzle for, for us. Um, but now the statics are very different. So through that square plaque diffuser, we're seeing 0 0.016 inches of static compare that to the six foot chilled beam and we're up at 0.22, which is on the lower end of what we see. Um, and we'll talk about what that does in a second here, but 
uh, very different static pressures, even though you have the same amount of CFM going through it. Um, so that, that does affect the system. So if we, if we look at this equation for leakage, Q is the leakage, uh, and compare the two systems at different pressures, um, what we find is that we see about three times the amount of leakage out of the chill beam uh, at, with a higher pressure because of the higher pressure than we would out of the VAV diffuser. Um, so same duct, same um, leakage classes, uh, the only difference is the pressure. We're, we're leaking three times as much. Uh, and the other downside is, is now we're 15% out where we're only 5% out with the VAV diffuser. Um, so you could have done the ducts perfectly compared to, the, or when thinking of it as a VAV system, but with chill beams, it's a little more sensitive to it. Um, so just want to keep that duct as tight as you can. And uh, just know that leakage uh, can, be, can, can have a, high, a greater effect on a chill beam system. So uh, last section for this balancing uh, conversation is the in-situ testing that we did. Um, so we took a, a few beams, three beams uh, to be exact, and, and mocked up some, um, some weird duct patterns just to try to get some bends in there. Um, the downside to this configuration, I think, was that uh, we had very short duct runs. Uh, we didn't really have enough space to make a big um, realistic test situation scenario. Um, so this is kind of what we were, we were uh, able to achieve here. We did uh, swap out one of the ducts for a straight from a straight duct, straight hard duct into a, a flex duct with some crazy bends in it, uh, to see what that what effect that had. Um, and we're just kind of exploring what happens when you have different leakage classes and uh, different bends, and um, also what what happens in the main trunk versus the the branch trunks. So uh, we w took these three beams and, and we did a characterization test in the lab. Um, so we had a pretty accurate and recent data on those those uh, exact beams. Um, and then we started uh, looking at the, uh, the ductwork. So we sealed it as tight as possible, uh, pressure tested it, so made sure there was no leakage, leakage at all, uh, filled any kind of gaps and butted it all in, went, uh, went pretty overboard with, uh, with sealing this thing. And then what we did was we actually uh, we took a screwdriver and started poking holes in it. Um, so we're trying to, to see what different leakage classes, uh, what the effect that has on the, the chill beams and the balancing process. Um, so we did different like class two, four, six, and um, just tried to see what, what that would do to the uh, to the balancing procedure. Um, we also used a couple of different traverses. So if uh, if you have a small duct, you may want to downsize your traverse. Uh, use a different size pitot tube. Um, if you have too large of a pitot tube, you may not be able to get a reading close enough to the wall of that duct um, to to get an accurate um, full point traverse. Uh, so we did use both of these uh, the eighth inch probe or pitot tube and the pre eight uh, pitot tube as well. Um, so here's some notes that we found. Um, we, we noticed that the traverse upstream of the branch, so in the main trunk, was always within 5% of the flow measuring station. So we were pretty accurate there. Um, the inaccuracies that we saw from that were actually farther down in the, in the branch ducts, which is what we would expect from a feedback we get on, on site. Um, also, partial traverses were responsible for errors up to 11%. So if you're, if you're missing a, one of those data points on your traverse, depending on what, what diameter you have, you have to take a certain amount of points. If you skip a couple, it can have a really big impact on what you see, and that's just that may be because you don't get a full picture of what the the flow pattern's like. Is it a fully uniform flow? Is there um, a high and a low point in that uh, cross section of the flow? Um, so you may not get, be getting a good average if you if you reduce some of those points and don't take all of the points that you're supposed to take. Um, so that can have a pretty significant effect. Um, so considering you may have five percent leakage or something already, uh, then ten percent error on top of that could be pretty substantial. Um, so we also found that the sum of the beam airflows uh, were always within 10%, all the way up to class 12. So uh, in this small duct test that we did, uh, we were able to get away with class 12 and still be fairly accurate. Um, I'm not sure that would actually scale into the field uh, because you much have, you'd have much longer duct runs. So if you have a certain leakage per 100 foot, um, if you have much longer duct runs, you can have much more duct length and more leakage, therefore. So uh, even at the same duct class, if you have a longer length, you're going to have more leakage through that, uh, that uh, length of duct. Um, so that may not be a, a, great, um, a great conclusion to bring to the site, to the field testing. Now, we also, in our case, found no differences between hard duct and flex duct. Uh, and I also, again, I also think this is probably not a great conclusion for the field, um, just because we installed fresh flex duct. We're very careful with it. There's nothing happening. Um, nobody's poking holes in it to, to measure a traverse. Uh, and not plugging that. So in the field, you may have somebody bumping it. There could be some uh, holes that form, maybe even fatigue just from moving that around a lot. Um, so there could be some issues on site that we wouldn't have seen in our lab because we're very careful with the lab, um, whereas on site, things can happen. 
Uh, and there's also, even in our scenario, this little scenario that we mocked up, we still had a hard time getting within 5% of the tolerance. Uh, so it can be very challenging to get uh, very, very accurate at these low, low, low velocities, low air flows, and, uh, and higher static pressures. Um, so that's our, our mock-up there. Uh, we're going to kind of change directions here and, and back up into the narrative discussion. Um, real quick, I'm going to check the, the questions to make sure uh, we've got all the questions answered. Looks like we're okay for uh, for now, but um, feel free to pop your head in the chat and ask some questions, and uh, we'll, I'll stop and, and answer those as we go along. So with that, we'll we'll change gears into the narrative discussion. So this is backing up from the installation side, and now we're kind of hopping all the way back to the beginning of the design phase, uh, as opposed to where we just were in the uh, in the installed side of it. So now we back up to the the initial idea phase, and how do you handle um, the, the very beginnings of these children's systems and design discussions. So uh, if you're considering a different system, you maybe you haven't selected your system yet and you're considering chill beams, um, one thing to think about, or the one way to think about the system is you have the same building. Um, so what that means is that you're in the same location, same outside ambient air conditions, uh, same ventilation requirements, same occupancy, same plug loads. Uh, all the stuff that's going on inside the building has not changed. Uh, the only real difference is the system you're using to treat those loads. Um, so you also have the same cooling and heating loads, um, plug loads, occupant loads, everything else going on in the space. Um, so what that means is, and one thing that you want to think about with the system is there's generation equipment, uh, what the equipment that's creating the energy to remove and add heat to a space. There's also distribution energy. So the, the devices that are going to take that energy and, and move it, migrate it throughout the building. Um, so here's a chart comparing three different uh, strategies, three different systems, um, BAV in the left, BRF in the middle, and radiant cooling and chill beam systems on the right side here. Um, so what, what you'll see first is uh, going back to that comment on the generation equipment, uh, the bottom side here is all the same. So it's all the same number of BTUs you have to generate. So the loads have not changed, the ambient air conditions, because they're in the same location, uh, has not changed. Um, so you really need the same amount of generation. Uh, the, the real savings that we're trying to attack and uh, where we found some inefficiencies that we can improve on is the, gener the distribution energy. Um, so essentially, it's, it's really mostly the fan energy. Uh, we are going to increase the pump energy. So you'll see that black section, which is the pump energy, does grow a little bit. But uh, we're, we're definitely making up for it with the fan energy that we're saving. Um, so that's the idea behind chilled beams is, is reduce the amount of air volume that needs to be moved around the building and uh, add a little water to, to take care of that and make that more efficient. Um, so that's uh, one way to think about these. The buildings don't change, but um, we're just trying to treat the same loads more efficiently with less airflow. Uh, so what that means for the system is that the, the air handler for the VAD system is doing all of the work for you. It's, uh, it's doing your entire sensible load, all of your laid load, and also your ventilation requirements. Um, compare that to a chill beam system, it's a little bit different because we have the uh, air handler doing partial sensible, usually a minority, hopefully it's below 50% or even down to the, the 20s and 30% of your total sensible capacities. Uh, but your chiller is also coming down, it's touching the space uh, through the chilled beam. Um, that's going to be doing the rest of your sensible. <laughs> but uh, the weight is actually still all handled by the air handler. And uh, this is where I think some of the intricacies of a chilling system kind of start, is uh, making sure you can treat that laden load with a reduced air volume. So we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. And then the uh, last point here is that the air handler still is also doing your ventilation requirement. Uh, so those bottom two points don't change. The only difference is we're removing some of that sensible load from the air handler. And uh, if you have a DX chiller or an air handler, that might be taking some of the load. If you have a, a water-cooled air handler, you're still going to be seeing, the chiller is going to be seeing that load as well. Um, so uh, maybe an obvious point at this point if you're familiar with chill beams, but uh, we found that water is, is much more energy dense than airflow is and much more easy to move around a building. And that's really what we're taking advantage of here. Uh, so we found that a seven inch duct diameter plus a half inch water pipe can transport about the same amount of energy as an 18 by 18 inch duct. Uh, so essentially it's a low profile system as well. We, we kind of harp on the energy benefits of chilled beams. But another reason we see people kind of getting pushed into this decision of to use chilled beams or, or trying to opt for this is it's a low profile system. So if you wanted to raise your, your ceiling to ceiling heights or floor to ceiling heights, or you have, you're have you kind of stuck with a, a small interstitial space, uh, chill beams can fit into some pretty narrow spaces. Uh, our most popular product is a nine and a half inch tall chilled beam. So it, any conductor from the side, so you don't need a lot of vertical space. 
Um, so looking at the, the power, uh, just kind of exploring why it's more efficient. Uh, we've got some two, two power curves or two power equations at the top right, one for fan energy and one for pump energy. So consider an example of 370,000 BTUs. Uh, we're going to use an entering air temperature of 55 degrees. We're at a dew point. Um, and then also use entering water of 57 degrees. These are pretty common temperatures for tow beam systems. Uh, and the 55 is pretty common for all air as well. So what that means, uh, if I'm using a 20 degree delta T on the air side, uh, I actually need about 17,000 CFM to, uh, to meet that sensible load at a 20 degree delta T. Uh, and that yields about a 39 brake horsepower, 38.8 brake horsepower on that, that fan motor. So compare that to a similarly sized chill beam system. We're going to use the same sensible capacity. Uh, we're going to need about 7,000 CFM. Um, so much less CFM. And uh, that actually yields about 20.4 brake horsepower on the air handler of the fan, and then 1.5 brake horsepower on the pump. So not a lot of, of horsepower added. So the, the total there is about 22 brake horsepower, or 44% less at peak load than the VAB system. So this is the idea behind it, uh, really where, where the efficiencies can be gained. So what that looks like, what that translates to, is uh, for an office selection, um, I'll say this a couple times throughout the next few slides, but uh, we'll, we'll probably start with the baseline VAV example of uh, one CFM per square foot. And with a chill beam system, for an office space in particular, you can get down to 0.3, even 0.2 if you're very aggressive and have the right space conditions. But uh, what that means for the building, as you would go from these two risers in this VAV uh, style design, you got a ring around the sides as well, but you have two main air handlers with pretty large risers. Uh, and we move this to a chill beam system, we're able to reduce um, the number of risers first uh, to one. We can cut one of those out. And we also reduce the size of this riser as well. Uh, we're, we're basically cutting out 60% of the CFM that you need, uh, maybe 70 or at times 80%. Um, but I would say 60% is a pretty conservative uh, reduction in airflow from a VAV baseline system to, uh, to a chill beam system. Um, and we still, we do have a bigger chiller most likely. And uh, some more pump energy is going to come back into the space, but uh, it's a cleans up the, the uh, footprint of the building a little bit by reducing that ductwork and mechanical room size. Um, so, kind of getting back into the, the conversation of uh, early system design, there's a couple things you're going to want to find out uh, just to size the the budget phase or the narrative discussion. Um, you want to look at your total building loads, and there's a couple ways you can do this. Um, if you want to base it on square footage, you can use a certain BTUs per square foot. Um, usually 25 BTUs per square foot to 35 is kind of where I would start. Uh, and then you can take your total footprint of the building that you would expect, uh, multiply that, and there's a, a decent sensible load to start with. Um, it probably is not very accurate. As you go along the project, you'll get more and more accuracy uh, into that number, but that's a good way to start the discussion. Uh, and then also the latent load, you can typically base that off of the occupancy. A couple hundred BTUs of latent energy per person. Um, so if you know what you expect the building occupancy to be, you can get an idea of what your latent load would be as well. Um, so that's a good way to kind of get your your baseline or early early discussion sensible loads and latent loads. And uh, train trace is one thing we see come up a lot. So we'll, we'll take a peek at some of those values. Um, one thing we see every now and then is people like to look at the uh, at the uh, the coil selection which is not a good place to start, actually, if you're looking at the train trace um, software, um, that the coil load is actually going to see it's the ambient conditions um, that the air handler is treating, not the space conditions that you want the beams to treat. So that's one thing to be very careful of, just make sure you're getting the right loads. Uh, you'll see here at the bottom, we have um, about 600,000 BTUs on that space peak sensible, and the coil peak sensible is much higher than that at 945. Um, so you would, uh, if you use that wrong number, you'd be oversizing your system by quite a bit. Um, so do be careful and make sure you get the right, um, the right loads. You want the space peaks for cooling and heating. Uh, and then also you can use the number of people that train trace is going to spit out or you've been put into that um, to kind of get an idea of the latent uh, burden you're going to see from that air handler. Um, so just to wrap that point up, uh, be careful on which loads you size. You want to make sure you get the right ones. That, uh, and it's the internal loads. Uh, not the ambient loads the air handler would see, is what we want to provide to the beams. Um, so the three criteria you really need to select an early system design is, uh, is total space sensible, um, the heating loads, and the total space latent. Those are the three high-level components we would need to size the system. And so what you can do is you can take the software. Uh, you guys were around this morning. You, you probably saw a lot, uh, about an hour and a half of, of software. Um, so feel free to try that with a system design. You, <coughs> excuse me. 
when you have the higher loads, it does take a little while to, to chew through that iterative loop um, to get the solutions in these. So I would break that down into maybe two or 300,000 BTU chunks. Uh, so for example, this one would run better as a smaller chunk if it's a million. I'd probably separate that into five zones and then uh, run it from there. But uh, you can do it this way and it just takes a little longer. Um, and you can put the entire building load, depending on what your sensible BTUs per square foot would be, take that estimation, plug it into your sensible load and your latent load, and uh, really treat the whole building as one zone, um, or break it out into similar zones, uh, in smaller chunks. And then this will give you a good idea of how many beams you need and what links you can get away with. Uh, you can dictate those links and uh, pick one, and then allow the software to, to choose the quantity, um, or you can give the flexibility to do both. But this is a good way to get a, kind of a budget sizing uh, you know how much how much footage of beam do I need? How much is it going to cost? Uh, this is a great way to start that uh, that conversation and uh, kind of get an early phase design. And uh, obviously, as you go along, this is going to change a little bit. Uh, you may need more or less depending on the resolution of your zones, how small they are, what they need. Um, so it may change a little bit, but this is a good way to get a first uh, initial idea of what you should be seeing. And uh, a little bit random side here, but just to go over the benefits of chill beams again, the reason you want to consider this system, uh, or a couple of benefits that uh, take place when you do consider a chill beam system, uh, we're able to reduce the duct size uh, of both the main and the branch ducts. So all the ducts can be reduced across the building. Um, so that can allow you to get more usable space, both in your ceiling and, and at times even your floor, floor plan, your footprint. Um, so that's a couple of things that can be pretty big points uh, in favor of this, this type of system. Um, also, you may have the ability to, to increase your floor to floor height to raise your ceilings up a little bit. Um, we've also seen an example, I think Chris went over this morning, about uh, they were able to shrink the whole building and have some facade savings just by having less square area on the outside of the building. So that can actually have a pretty major impact on the cost of a project. And then uh, also mechanical equipment sizing can be smaller. Uh, so that, that's another option to, uh, to save some space and maybe some money on the project. Um, definitely when costing these types of systems, uh, it's, it's really good to consider the entire scope. Uh, if you just compare the terminal chilled beam to a square plaque diffuser, it's, it's not going to look like it makes sense. Uh, but when you back that, zoom back out um, to the whole system, it can actually be cost effective, even at first cost at times, uh, but definitely in the ROI down the road. Um, so let's uh, explore another example here um, for a high level design. Again, I'm just looking for my sensible loads, my total latent loads. I'm going to look at my ventilation requirements as well. Uh, another thing to consider could be your DOAS versus recirculating air, air handlers. That can change the wet bulb that uh, you're able to provide to the, to the building um, so that leaving air temperature can be affected by that from the air handler. <coughs> and we'll get into that in a little bit later as well. But uh, two examples here, uh, looking at the same square footage, uh, but one's going to be an office space example, one's going to be a classroom example. Um, so just looking at the ASHRAE 62.1 table for for ventilation and airflow rates, and also taking the occupant density, you can get a pretty good idea of what, uh, what you need in that space, uh, both for the latent loads and sensible loads. So in this case, for the office example, you need 5 CFM per person, and you need 0.06 CFM per square foot. Um, but the occupant density is pretty small, five people per 1,000 square feet. Uh, compare that to the classroom example, you have 35 people per 1,000 square feet, so seven times the amount of people or occupant density in that space. That definitely changes the system and the requirements you're going to want to see out of that. Um, so you would uh, you'd have much less people in the office example. That number is not correct, actually. But uh, we're looking at uh, BTUs per square foot. You can start a budget of 25. Uh, often I'll go up to 35, but uh, I find that 25 is a little more accurate, I think, um, when you average out the different spaces that you have. So uh, what did that do to the system? We found out that we needed about 8,750,000 BTUs of sensible load. Um, based on that, uh, that that's uh, BTUs per square footage number. So that's uh, driving one part of the conversation. So now you know what to, to size. And uh, what I actually found with these, it kind of surprised me, was that both of these scenarios were driven by the sensible load. Uh, what, I mean, what I mean by that is that the airflows were driven up by the amount of sensible load we had to treat. Um, so some spaces can be driven by sensible or latent load. Um, every now and then you'll see one by minimum ventilation, but it's actually very difficult to get to the minimum ventilation while still, still treating both your latent loads and your Sensible loads, often one of those two other variables is going to drive the airflow up above your ventilation. Um, but you'll be much closer to your ventilation load than you would be with the PAP system. So it's, it's still a good system and a good efficient system, even though you're not at ventilation uh, requirements. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, so just as that comparison, to, to keep going with that comparison, uh, on the office example in this case, with these given parameters, the ventilation, the sensible load, latent load, 
was able to meet all of those with uh, 117,000 CFM on the chill beam system. Uh, compare that to the VAV system, you would still need about 405,000 CFM. Uh, so close to four times as much, so a little like three and a half times as much uh, airflow. Uh, and then also the, the office or the classroom example, we're close to double or half of the, the VV is about double the chill beam system. Um, so you're still saving about 50% of the, of the airflow. Uh, so good potential for energy reduction there. So uh, now we'll jump right into the air handler design. Uh, in my opinion, the, the most important piece of equipment on a chill beam system um, is going to be the air handler. That's what's going to dictate um, your dew point and if you can, can maintain your dew point and uh, retain control of that. Um, so the downside, if you don't control your dew point, you lost your, your latent cooling capacity from the air handler, you, the dew point is going to rise. In order to avoid condensation issues, you have to bump your, air, your water temperature up. Um, so now you've lost capacity as well. So it's very important that the air handler is able to maintain that space uh, latent conditioning and, uh, and not lose track of the dew point. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that, uh, why that's so important for a while here. Uh, so consider an example, a pretty standard starting point of 75 degrees dry bulb and 50% relative humidity. Um, the moisture content in that scenario is 64.6. So essentially that's what you're trying to maintain. That's, that's your set point. And uh, you don't want to go much higher than that on the grains per pound, the moisture content, and the space. Um, so we want to want to keep it the space at 64.6 at the highest. Um, so consider a, a more standard selection on your air handler: 55 dry bulb, 54 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulb. <coughs> so we're almost saturated at that point, about 95% humidity. Uh, the moisture content in that selection is going to be about 60.4 grains per pound. So our delta W, our grains per pound moisture differential, is about 4.2 grains per pound. Um, not a whole lot, but in a VV system, you need a lot of airflow. Uh, it totally works um, in that scenario. Uh, so you're good because you have so much airflow. But uh, when we go to a chill beam system, we're reducing the amount of airflow throughout the building by quite a bit. Um, so if we kept that same condition for the air handler, we would not be able to meet our late load anymore. If you cut the airflow by a third of that same inner air condition, you've also cut the latent capacity uh, into a third. Um, so a couple options are to increase your airflow which we don't want to do in a chill beam system. We're trying to be efficient, use less air. Um, or you can dehumidify that entering air, um, which is what we're going to talk about here for a second. So selection two is a more chill beam specific scenario that we see, uh, 55 dry bulb, 51.6 wet bulb. Um, so that yields 51.6 grams per pound. Um, so a little bit higher of a, of a delta W grams per pound differential. Uh, now we're about 13 grams per pound difference. Uh, so you have a much more capacity, essentially three times the amount of capacity as selection one there. Um, and that, that uh, brings you down to a 49 degree dew point uh, off of the air handler. Uh, so I will talk about why that makes sense and how we approach those numbers in a second. Um, so consider uh, same same two selections, uh, selection 1, 55, 54, and selection 2, 55, 51.6. Uh, we'll use the same CFM uh, for each one, 6700 CFM. But uh, take a look at the latent BTUs we get on each of these selections. So the first one, we're right at 20,000 BTUs or so. Uh, and when we drop that wet bulb uh, 2.4 degrees Fahrenheit, we're actually able to triple the amount of latent capacity from that, um, that system per CFM. Um, so that, that makes a lot of sense for beams just because if we're looking at a one CFM per square foot baseline example for, uh, um, for just kind of a rule of thumb for VAV systems, uh, if we're able to do that with the chill system at 0.3 CFM per square foot or a third, um, we would need to triple that uh, that airflow or the latent capacity per CFM to get that latent capacity back. So essentially, you've cut the airflow down to a third, 30% of what it was originally, and uh, to make up that latent conditioning and get you the latent capacity back so you don't lose control of your dew point, you, uh, you triple, uh, dehumidify the air enough to triple the latent capacity per CFM. And now you've gotten all that latent conditioning back. Um, so that's what's important about the system is making sure you have enough latent conditioning in the space to maintain your space dew point. Uh, and we do that by dehumidifying from the air handler. <clears throat> so another example, um, take a more aggressive approach, uh, still the 1.0 baseline CFM per square foot for the VAB system. And let's drop it all the way down to a 0.2 CFM per square foot for the chilled beam. Um, so now we need five times the amount of latent capacity per CFM. Uh, so to get to there, we need a wet bulb of 50.3. Uh, and this is pretty aggressive. This is a 46 degree dew point. Um, but this is probably the lowest that uh, you'd ever really need to go with the system uh, to still get to uh, to that 
the ventilation requirement and meet your latent loads. And uh, often you'll still be driven up by your sensible loads, so you may not be able to get to that vent event anyway. Uh, and then last point on condensation here for, for this batch of slides is uh, it's not instantaneous. It's going to take some time for that condensation to occur. Uh, so the reason we recommend two to three degrees entering water temperatures above your space dew point is to give you a time buffer um, to, to look at your BMS. Maybe something's happening in space. You're monitoring your dew points or you have condensate sensors on the water pipes. Uh, and once those trigger, it's not going to start raining instantaneously. Um, that water is going to bead. It's going to form uh, droplets on the fins and, uh, and on the, the copper coils. And then over time, it's going to grow and grow and then start to drop. So you have a while before it starts falling, uh, even if it's already uh, accumulating. Um, so you have time to see that scenario is happening. You can see your, you can monitor your water temperatures. Compare that to a couple of space uh, dew points on the high risk areas, maybe a room with operable windows or a door that could be left open. Um, those are two scenarios where you don't need to, to sensor or uh, monitor everything in the, in the building, but take a look at the high risk spaces and see where it's going to condense first. And those are the ones you want to want to be careful with and monitor. Um, but, but having that two to three degree buffer of entering water temperature above your space dew point um, can give you uh, some time to respond. So you'll, you'll see this scenario coming in. Um, maybe your dew point is risen and your water temperature is below that. Uh, you have time to catch it and figure out why. Uh, so in my experience of several hundred children projects, I've seen condensation only a couple times. And uh, the first example that I've seen is that uh, the facilities team didn't really understand the system. Uh, maybe they thought they were a fan coil system and thought the 57 degree water was too high. And uh, they ended up dropping it down to the 40s, which um, obviously is, is going to start condensing. Um, so that was the first, uh, the first time I saw this was uh, essentially a facilities team didn't really understand what they were doing. Um, on that water temperature. So educating the, the people who are going to maintain the facilities can be pretty important. Uh, and then secondly, if the air handler goes down but the chiller stays on, you're still pumping that cold water around but you have no dehumidification potential. Um, that's the second scenario I've seen um, condense. So uh, neither issue is really a, a chill beams issue, but it is a system level issue. Um, so if you're monitoring these spaces and you see a scenario coming in where the entering water temperature is, uh, is below the space dew point, um, just take a look at and then uh, start to figure out what's going on, why that's happening, and uh, ways to mitigate that. Uh, you can bring the water temperature up, or you can recirculate and, and stop sending water to that zone if it's uh, at risk. Um, so there's a few ways to do it, but it essentially becomes a control issue and not so much a chill beam problem. Um, but uh, we don't see this very often, uh, and I think it's usually because people do a good job designing the systems and uh, put the right safeties in place. Um, so it's, it, people have been successful with this and uh, do not actually see condensation very often. So we've covered this slide already, some of the balancing slides. Um, let's look at some office spaces and some different scenarios you would see. Uh, just kind of doing some layouts. Um, there's a few different types of spaces you'll see in this type of building. Uh, one could be an open office area like the bottom right. Uh, in this case, we have a, a long line of beams in the middle of the room. And we actually have, also have a 12-inch wide chill beam against the facade, against that, uh, the exter exterior of the footprint here. 12-inch uh, wide, it's probably thrown one way into the space. And then you also have a conference room on the left side, um, and then we have small offices on the, on the top right. So each of these spaces present kind of a unique challenge. Uh, for example, on this, uh, the office spaces, you, you may not want any VAV potential there. Um, so you, you just have a, an auto balancing damper or a, a few manual quadrant damper, and that's the way, the way you set and uh, kind of dictate the CFM going to each of these, these rooms. But typically, these, these small offices are going to be anywhere from 20 CFM to 50, maybe 75 CFM. Um, but you're not going to see a whole lot of savings in, uh, in balancing or, or using a VAV strategy in those spaces. Uh, but compare that to both the conference room and the open office spaces. Um, these spaces can require a lot more airflow, <clears throat> both for both for the CF or the, uh, the sensible loads and the latent loads. And uh, if you have a fluctuation in the amount of people, the occupants in those spaces, uh, you can see very different loads. So uh, I would uh, absolutely recommend having VAVs in these areas and uh, and have a min max uh, set point or uh, a way of VAV airflow strategy to uh, kind of get some more energy out of the building. And uh, there's a couple other things you can do to track, uh, you can track CO2 or humidity, and uh, that can kind of give you an idea of how many people are in the space, if you have enough airflow to, uh, to meet those loads, and uh, it can fluctuate um, and track that with a VAV. So there's a, a few different ways to control this type of space. I think we've got a question. Yeah, we actually have a few questions here. Um... The first one is is asking about uh, the pandemic and uh, MERV 13 filter requirement on recirculated air. 
and uh, basically what are we doing to address that? So we, we try to avoid having filters with, uh, with chilled beams. Um, so that, that's a great question. We can absolutely provide filters in these. It, it, it will work, but it will derate the capacity of the, the water coil. Um, so if you add a lot of pressure drop in front of that water coil, you're going to lose some capacity out of it. Um, so a couple of ways you can do that, you can add a fan filter into the space. Uh, we also, Price has a room air purifier that's a plug and play solution on the ground, uh, also an overhead air purifier. Um, so if we're going to add filtration back to the space, I would, I would do it through another device in the same space. So to add to that, the filter that we would add to a beam, if it is, is really not a filter, it's a lint screen. So effectively, it's catching basketballs versus catching what we're trying to catch. So I think what uh, Nathan is, is pushing you guys to is a, an alternative method for clean air. Yeah, and that way you get the you get the energy efficiency of the chill beam, and you also get to filter the space uh, via a more efficient method of filtration. Yeah, great. And then another thing that we've seen recently is uh, uh, needlepoint bipolar ionization introduced at the beam, which can help with that uh, concern as well. Um, one more question here: Is there a preference for blow through versus draw through air handlers for the cooling coil? Uh, to keep supply air dry bulb down? Yeah. I would say there's a marginal benefit for the blow through piece to carry over uh, potential off the coil. But I, I don't see any benefit. Off yeah, I w that's what I was thinking. What yeah. about reheat off the motor? Yeah. You get a you get a little you, a little you get a couple one or two degree boost yeah. off that fan if it's draw through. Yeah. 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 All right, and then we have uh, we have another one here. How do you deal with system startup when beginning with a hot and high humidity environment? Uh, <laughs> So that's absolutely a great question. That's usually the first time the building uh, beams sweat. And after that, it's the only time the beams sweat. So uh, what I normally would recommend is uh, really two things. One would be like an after hours um, humidity set point in the space, where let's just say that after the humidity level gets to a certain point at night, that your equipment turns on kind of like a, a night setback uh, for temperature. And then the other would be very similar to what we would call an optimum start stop uh, for once again, temperature, but this would be an optimum start stop for humidity uh, where we would try to turn the equipment on uh, early in the morning. You would basically uh, keep the chilled water valves all closed on the beams until the building uh, humidity levels got to the levels that you wanted, then you would activate the beam and uh, go from there. So those are pretty typical sequences of operation. Um, but once they don't do it once, they'll uh, they'll always do it right again afterwards. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Yeah, great question, and thanks for chiming in there, guys. Um, so just to reiterate that point, that uh, it's really it's really important to monitor your space dew points and know what those are. And if, uh, if you're bringing in water colder than that, that's going to be, that's going to cause some problems. Um, so definitely dehumidify the space. Uh, definitely on startup, uh, maybe Monday morning, bring the air on first. Uh, especially after the building is, is just getting started up, you just closed the facade of the building. There could be a lot of moisture in there. So definitely monitor your, your dew points in there before you bring the water in. Um, so great points. Yeah, so it sounds like we've got a few questions. Uh, I think we'll just keep going through some questions here. Yeah, next one here, uh, do beams lock out when environment environment is outside operating parameters? So essentially, yeah, I think Ed's got some comments to make here too. But, yeah, um, I mean, that's that's really a, uh, a temperature controls uh, question. Uh, the beam is a pretty simple device. You know, it's a coil in a box uh, with a valve. And the valve is basically controlled by the building automation system. And we can make beams super smart if uh, if you have the right control sequences associated to it. So um, what we would like to recommend, and this is what I would push, is that 
you would have one or two humidity sensors on the floor. You would be watching those humidity sensors and you also use the temperature sensor in the space. Um, you would then calculate for dew point. And if you're, you know, basically at the dew point temperature in the space, an alarm would uh, go off. Uh, or you could set it to absolutely close the valve on the beam, which would prevent the beam from sweating. I recommend normally the alarm piece because it does take quite a while for the beam to uh, coil to sweat enough where the droplets of water on the fins are heavy enough to actually fall. Um, and we've done many, many tests uh, in our environmental chambers. It can take hours. So just as long as you have a maintenance staff uh, that's available to go see uh, what the issue could be uh, and then address that issue, then you have the choice of either turning the valve off or not. Yeah, you've got a lot of options there, but it really comes down to your control sequence and, uh, and how that control is set up. Uh, so there's a lot of options. We can definitely talk through specific scenarios if that ever comes up, uh, but that's definitely a great question to ask. Yeah, yeah, these are these are all great questions, guys. So thanks for asking. Uh, the next one here: Are you able to use an active chilled beam as a passive beam during unoccupied hours? And what would the D rate be? Uh, the D rate would be pretty significant. Uh, I'm sure there's some potential, but uh, you're not going to get a whole lot of convective cooling out of it. You will get some radiant radiant uh, cooling, and I'm sure the D rate would be pretty substantial. So it's uh, I wouldn't recommend that method. Um, that actually might be a good application to have some passive chill beams in the space, uh, maybe around the perimeter, and use the active beams in control. So I think that's really a, a it's really a function of the free area of the beam itself. So for a passive beam to really work properly, you need to get that warm air up above the coil, uh, and we normally recommend 50% free area uh, for that warm air to get around the coil, effectively above the coil, so it you know, it, it finds that cool surface and, you know, that buoyancy changes and then the air falls to the floor. So uh, it may give you some, but I think Nathan is absolutely on it where the D rate's going to be really significant. I, I don't think you're going to get a lot of cooling out of it. All right, I think that's all the questions for now. Uh, feel free to, to add some to the chat or add in the questions section. And uh, we'll probably stop in a few minutes and uh, get some more questions. But I uh, appreciate you guys interacting, and uh, feel free to stop us, and we'll, we'll dig into whatever you guys want to chat on. Um, so moving back to the space design, there's a couple other applications we see pretty regularly. Office spaces is definitely one of the top categories that uh, we apply beams in. Um, there's a couple others. My clicker will come back to me. Um, the next type uh, could be a patient room. So we're actually allowed to include the induced airflow as part of our total air change requirement or air change rate in that space. So you need two, uh, two fresh air changes uh, minimum, and then you also need four total air changes. Uh, so with chill beams, if we're, since we're allowed to include the, uh, the induced airflow uh, per ASHRAE 170, we actually only need the, the two minimum fresh air changes. So at that lower fresh air uh, requirements, meaning that we're already inducing enough to, to get that four air change per hour um, total. So that's a great application for patient rooms. Um, and uh, Chris mentioned earlier, we do have some security chill beams for, for those higher risk applications. And also standard chill beams work great in uh, regular patient rooms. Typically one four foot long ACBL is, is enough to treat that load in the space. Uh, the most beam I've seen used in a room like this was a, a two four foots. <clears throat> and uh, one question that comes up in these spaces is uh, how do you handle the, the shower, the humidity from the sink? Um, usually the, the Bathroom is going to be a negative pressure space. You're going to exhaust a little bit more than you supply. And uh, that really keeps that moisture locked in there and uh, make sure all the smells from the bathroom and uh, the moisture that's in there don't actually get up into the beam. Um, so that's a, kind of a good application here for, for chilled beams in non-critical spaces. Um, so we are considered a group A device, which just means we're on the ceiling, we're blowing horizontally. Um, and uh, here's a chart showing where you can apply these, these type of, of beams. And now one note I like to make here is that you, you do not need a MERV filter on a dry coil and chilled beams. So that's how we're getting around that filtration requirement is uh, by keeping a dry coil. Um, so we're keeping that water temperature pretty high, well above your space dew point, a couple of degrees or two to three degrees. 
Um, so if you were to use a condensing device, you would absolutely need a filter. Uh, but that's how we're able to get around that uh, requirement. Um, so just to compare the air flows in that space, um, looking at the, the air, air you need for a VV system, you need about 120 CFM. Uh, because we can include the induced airflow as part of that air change rate, we can do that with half the CFM on a chill beam system. Uh, then classrooms are another good uh, example we see quite a, quite a bit of. Um, both K-12 through and a lot of higher education uh, are both scenarios we see pretty often with chill beams. Any building that's going to use a water system and have a hydronic plant somewhere is a great uh, candidate for chill beams. And uh, even if they're already using water and cold water, we love to take off the return side and, uh, and use that to be more efficient if possible. But uh, going back to the classrooms, we found that uh, students are not often in the classroom. There's a good chunk of the day where the kids are just at recess, they're at lunch, they're in different classrooms. Um, so you got a lot of time where that room's not occupied. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to use VAV in this application and uh, do a turn down to, to an unoccupied mode. Um, and uh, just turn down, save some airflow in that space. Um, so another, looking at the same example, or this classroom example, 25 occupants, uh, what I found was we needed about 35,000 BTUs of sensible load and 6,000 BTUs of latent load. Uh, so with the VAB system, I, I was able to do this with 1,600 CFM. Uh, compare that to 645, 650 with the, with the chill beam system. And uh, depending on the occupancy, we can even get a little bit lower than that at times. Um, so again, almost a third of the, the airflow in this scenario. Uh, then another example I like to talk about is, uh, is fresh air. So how much fresh air are we providing to the building? Uh, this example, we'll look at 60% uh, recirculation on the uh, on the, the VAV air handler over there. Um, same example as earlier, the 370,000 BTUs, 55 degree entering air and 57 degree entering water. Uh, if you're recirculating 60% of the airflow with the VAV air handler, um, you're actually only supplying 6,800 CFM of fresh air. Uh, compare that to the chill beam if you're using a dedicated outside air system. Uh, it's 100% fresh air, so 7,000 CFM of fresh air. Um, so I think it's a pretty conservative uh, recirculation rate there. I've, I've definitely seen higher than that in some scenarios. Um, but this chill beam still comes out uh, providing more fresh air in this building, uh, which was kind of a fun exercise that I, I didn't really expect this to, to be the case. Uh, so we'll move on. Um, one other option that we see uh, in the day, um, air quality has definitely been a huge concern of late uh, for obvious reasons, but we do have some options to put bipolar ionization within the chill beams. Um, so that is a, an option that we can provide. It's a UL2998 compliant, so we are not creating ozone with this device. It's, it's powered lower, um, low enough that it will not do that, and certified to that uh, power level as well. Um, but if you're interested in that, we're, we can absolutely provide it in a, a range of our active chill beam options. Uh, another option, kind of what we mentioned earlier with the question on filtration, is if you have a mixing system, uh, probably would not do this in a displacement system because you will end up mixing the space. But in a mix system, uh, classrooms or office buildings, you can add that RIP, the room air purifier, uh, which is a plug and play solution. And this uh, this item can do UV, bipolar, and MERT filtration, so, uh, or HEPA even, I believe. So uh, there's uh, several options with both of these, the RIP and the OAP, the overhead air purifier. Um, so you can add these to the, the space to get some of that filtration in the, in the room. Um, so that's a couple other options for uh, air purification with chill beam systems. Um, you may not want to do it with the beams themselves, just so you, you want to keep that capacity and the efficiency of the, uh, the induction process. Um, so here's a good, a good workaround for, uh, for those clean air scenarios. So now we're kind of moving back away from the air side. <laughs> and we'll talk about the, the zone level water side design for a little while. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to bring the, the water to the chill beams. Um, and then we'll, the next section, we'll talk about a system level water side design which is just some ideas, uh, ways to get that, that warmer water temperature that you would see with a chill beam system um, if you just have the, uh, that chill, the cold chill water, 42 to 45. Uh, so we'll talk about both of those here, starting with the, uh, the zone level discussion. Uh, and I believe I mentioned this a few times, obviously we want to hammer home that the, uh, the dew point plus two to three degrees is kind of the, the operating entering water range that we want to see. Uh, one thing that people can be surprised about is the delta T across this water coil is, is not going to be the same um, <coughs> as you would see in a, like a fan coil or a uh, lower temperature water uh, system. We're actually only gonna get about two degrees to eight degrees, um, six in, in most scenarios. Four to six, I'd say, is the, is the most common. Uh, but we're actually kind of limited there by uh, getting delta T across the water coil. Uh, and we found that this is what's optimizing. We're trying to reduce the, the CFM, so we're really targeting um, optimizing for CFM and not really for delta T on the water side uh, often. Then uh, 0.2, 0.5 GPMs all the way up to 2.5 or three is kind of the maximum. 
uh, is what we see the, the GPMs in both heating and cooling operating through. Um, and then uh, zero to 10 foot ahead is, is kind of the pressure drop that we start uh, looking into. Um, can be more, depends on your system and what your pump can achieve. Uh, then also we do have two pipe and four pipe. Uh, one question I get surprisingly a lot is, uh, can you heat with a chill beam? Because you know it's called a chill beam. Uh, the answer is yes, you can absolutely heat and cool with a chill beam. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer almost, but uh, we can do two pipe heating. Uh, and this is where the question with the six way valve comes in. Uh, in that scenario, we'll show some examples in a minute, but uh, you have a four pipe system and we're going down to a two pipe chilled beam. Uh, and in that case, you would actually need a six way valve to do that reduction in pipes. Um, we also have a four pipe option where you would not need that. You can do two, um, uh, two way valves essentially, and you can control each uh, the cooling loop and the heating loop separately individually. Um, so that's uh, a couple of different options on, on ways to pipe the system. And uh, in my experience, it's, uh, I don't really have a huge preference on these. There are some downsides to the two pipe with the changeover. Uh, you will have some crossover in the uh, the medium. If you're using different levels of glycol or uh, glycol and heating and no glycol water and cooling, you will have some cross contamination with that two pipe system uh, if you do a changeover. Um, so that's uh, one thing to consider. And uh, so the chill beams are going to have, uh, with a four pipe system, we have, uh, we'll circuit the pipe a little bit differently. Um, so you have the same fin block, the same coil passing, and uh, all we do is dedicate a couple passes over to heating. Um, so nothing changes in the water coil. It's not two separate coils in there. It's just the same fin block. We just give away a couple passes for heating. Um, so that's how the four pipe works. Um, and uh, then again, you have two isolated loops, so you can control them both individually. So here's kind of a, a simple layout for a two pipe system. In this case, we're maybe cooling only, or we have six way valve somewhere upstream uh, at the zone level. Uh, in this case, you're probably on off or modulating. You can do either way on your uh, GPMs, control uh, control the water flow rates. Uh, also, you need a balancing valve in each one. Um, so that's a pretty simple layout for a two pipe design. Uh, four pipe design, you have the same, uh, same fin block essentially, but now you have two isolated circuits for both heating and cooling individually. Um, so that's kind of a easier way to control each loop individually. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the, the contamination in that scenario, um, but actually you get a little bit of a performance boost when you're using the two pipe uh, because you do have a little more passes, a few more passes. Um, in cooling, it's not substantial, and in heating, it can be significant. Um, so one thing to consider, but uh, we, we see that the system kind of drives this decision more than the beams themselves. It's kind of what, what do you have on site already, what are you able to, to achieve on site. Uh, here's that six-way valve we've been hitting at a little bit. Um, so you can see the four pipes coming in on the top right of that uh, drawing. Um, you can reduce the number of valves. Uh, one cool thing about the six-way valve is it does have two different CV values. So the characteristics are different in the heating loop versus the cooling loop. So you want to make sure you get the right loop piped up correctly. Um, otherwise, it may not balance well, or when it switches over, you may not have a lot of control. It is a modulating valve, so you can still control the flow rates with this device in both heating and cooling um, with a 0 to 10 signal and broken up into a few different uh, ranges. Um, so very interesting technology there, and we, we don't see it a whole lot outside of beams, but it's a pretty cool scenario to see with some chill beams at times. Then uh, kind of backing up a little bit into the system level, uh, if we're looking at um, uh, the, a two-pipe with a changeover, I've actually never seen this scenario, but I know it's possible, obviously, but uh, you would have the whole system is basically using the same piping, and you switch over with some valves from the chiller to the boiler uh, when you're switching modes. So the downside here is that you would actually not have uh, the ability to switch over from heating to cooling very quickly. The whole system is going to be in the same um, heating or cooling mode at the same time. So if the south side of the building needs some cooling, but the north side needs some heating, uh, you're kind of stuck and you, you have to have uh, one or the other and not both. Um, so that can, can prevent some, present some challenges. Um, the kind of bring this down to a, a local resolution, you can have a local 2.5 changeover. So not at the central level now, we're actually at the beam zone. So each one of these load uh, rectangles here could be one beam, it could be 10 beams, um, it could be a whole zone of beams. So that's a different resolution. In this case, you actually can switch over um, in each zone from heating to cooling. So one zone could be in cooling and the adjacent zone could be in heating. Um, so that gives you a little more flexibility, um, a little bit more complicated uh, piping and controlling strategy. Uh, another question we get is uh, how do you balance the water side? We don't see a, a lot of issues on the water side balancing. And uh, we're kind of, uh, we, don't, we don't mind using circuit setters or using reverse return. In my opinion, the, the most efficient, most cost effective solution is probably a blend of the two technologies. Uh, maybe having a balancing valve upstream at the zone level. Uh, and then doing that reverse return, so where you're using the, the length of piping to balance the chill beams at the zone level, 
Um, so you can do a mix of these and really it depends on what your space sees as to which one makes more sense uh, and also what you're more comfortable doing. Um, but they both are just two different methods to, to balance and make sure the GPMs, the flow rates are correct through the chilled beams. Uh, and then control of the flow rates to a valve. Uh, when we don't talk about too often is a three-way valve. Um, so in, in this case, you actually have the ability to recirculate a zone water temperature. So it's a good way to keep uh, that individual zone. Um, for example, if you have two different zones that are next to each other, one's got an upper window, or they both have upper windows, but one's open, one's closed. Um, with this recirculating zone water, you can actually keep that water temperature above dew point. Even if the door is open, window's open, and the, the moisture is coming in, um, you can control the water temperatures of each zone individually. So that's a pretty cool feature if you're really worried about condensation or you have somebody with upper windows, uh, maybe a dormitory or something like that, where you're, you're not going to be able to control the, the windows in that space. Um, so that's an interesting way, uh, way to, to run this. You would need a, a, a pump within that space as well. And then also uh, water system pressure control, so kind of a little bit different. Back to the balancing conversation, you can use a, a, a pump on, on the zone and have the, each individual zone here balance individually. Uh, and use a pressure differential sensor to, uh, to control each of those and balance them accordingly. So a lot of different methods too to pipe and control these, these zones. We'll, we'll jump into the system level design here. Um, so the next question we're trying to answer with this is uh, how do I get my 57 or 58 degree water? Uh, just kind of backing up to a, a more uh, system level discussion, equipment level discussion. Um, so again, just to reiterate, two to three degrees of dew point. Um, in heating, we're actually going to see about 90 to 140 degrees uh, with much larger delta Ts. Um, but the, the real point here is we, we typically see this cold water loop uh, in most hydronic applications. So chill beams are a little bit more unique. Uh, where we're not going to see that 42, 52, um, 10 degree delta T and uh, starting at that cold 42 degree water because um, we don't actually want to do latent conditioning with the chill beams in most applications. Uh, I'll talk about it some exceptions in a second as well. Uh, but what we're actually seeing it with the chill beam system is this uh, warmer temperature water loop. Um, it's for, for uh, sensible cooling only, uh, 58 degrees and returning in this case uh, 62 degrees. So four to six is pretty common delta T to have across these chill beam loops. Um, so the question is how do we bridge these two? We have uh, one chiller and uh, we want to have both a, a latent conditioning loop, maybe you have a water cooled chiller or fan coils and lobbies and you have chill beams in other places. You know, how do we how do we work with both of these systems and, uh, and get the water temperature for both? Uh, so there's a few ways to, to go about doing this. Closed mixing valve is one, um, very similar to the three mixing valve we just talked about at the zone level. Um, also, plate and frame heat exchangers are pretty common. Um, dedicated chiller is another good one uh, if your budget allows for an individual chiller on each loop. Uh, and then also district loops are, are great applications for chill beams. If you already have that mechanical plant producing water, it's a, it's a good thing to consider beams, tap in the return, and you already have some some uh, warmer water created there. Um, so here's a look at the two different loops mixed together. Um, the real difference, or the, the addition here you're gonna see is that a crossover with a three mixing valve. Um, so we have that cold water, and we're going to inject some of that cold water into the secondary loop, uh, that lighter blue colored loop as needed, uh, just to make sure we have the right capacity in that loop. Um, so if we get closer to the dew point, if we're dropping down to the 55 or lower, we'll turn that through the mixing valve off, and we'll close that loop. Uh, now the secondary loop's gonna run on its own until it needs more cooling, and we'll uh, open that valve back up and you can modulate that valve. Um, so that's, that's how you're working this primary secondary loop with the uh, three-way mixing valve. Uh, very similar to this actually would be a heat exchanger. Um, you have the same, same layout essentially, you're just uh, you're using a heat exchanger to, uh, to temper that water in the secondary loop uh, without actually directly injecting water into that, that secondary loop. It's a little bit safer, uh, not as much of a risk for cross-contamination. Now you can run two different solutions, uh, mediums, through those pipes as well, um, but very similar layout to the through the mixing valve. And then dedicated chillers, uh, a little bit more simple to, to lay this one out. Uh, there's no bridge across them, the two different loops entirely, so you can do what you need to. Uh, you can also have more resolution or more control over each chiller and, uh, and optimize each one for the delta Ts they're gonna be running at and the flow rates they're gonna be running at. Um, so we see this more often on larger high-rise buildings uh, or larger square footage campuses. And then uh, I would say district loop, uh, campus loop, we see this on very large campuses with multiple buildings typically or a mechanical plant somewhere outside. And uh, we love to take off that return water. It's gonna be typically upper 50s or low, upper 40s, low 50s maybe. Uh, so you may still need a heat exchanger to bring it up a little bit more uh, up to that 57, 58, the beams are gonna wanna see. 
Um, so you may still need to, to, to bring it up with a, another solution from before and mix and match, uh, but that's a good way to recapture and use that spent heat uh, that you've already captured through the, the low water loop, low temperature water loop, and uh, take some of that heat gain and use it for the chill feeds. Um, so then the last point we'll make here is uh, at times there are scenarios where you do want to see a condensing chill beam. Uh, we kind of talk about it's sensible only, but the, there are applications where you do want to condense. Um, maybe it's a cost-driven decision, and uh, you don't want to temper the water. You just want to have that low, low temp water all throughout the building and uh, save some piping costs. Uh, maybe you need more heat capacity per foot of chilled beam. You're not quite meeting your loads, and you want to drop that. Um, and essentially what you have to do to, to make this work and not rain is to add a drain pan to the chilled beam. Um, so you can imagine with a with a standard ACBL flat water coil, if you put a drain pan below it, you're blocking all that induction free area. So what we've done is actually uh, this black rectangle on the bottom of this coil is our drain pan, and we actually broke the flat water coil into an A-frame. Um, so it actually ends up with more surface area. So more, even at the tempered water conditions, you'll get more capacity per foot of beam. Uh, but it also allows us to capture that water if it does condense. So this could be, could be designed for non-condensing applications or condensing applications. Uh, works either way, but uh, now you also have a safety factor. Uh, if you do condense unexpectedly, which uh, in my experience doesn't happen too often, uh, but that gives you a kind of a security measure where uh, you don't have to worry about it quite as much. Uh, and also, just to point out, this, this video is sped up, so this is actually not in real time. Um, and it, it took us uh, over an hour to get to this point at 75 degrees and 80% humidity in our sacramentary chamber. I think uh, it's got a question. We got a question from Matt again. Um, what's the difference between an A-frame and a regular beam? Uh, so the difference is the A-frame is a much larger coil, so more surface area on it, um, whereas the regular ACBL has a flat water coil. Uh, so the major, major difference is the construction of the water coil and the amount of free area we have or, or surface area we have, so we'll get more energy out of the, uh, the A-frame water coil. So about 15 to 20% more efficient or more, more cooling out of this per foot than a standard water coil. Does the uh, size of the beam change dimensionally? Yes, that's a good point to make. So we're, we're going to add a few inches to the ACBL. I think it adds about four inches to the vertical height of it. Um, so this, this is about a 13 to 14 inch high model, whereas the standard ACBL is like uh, less than 10 inches. But so no it, drain pan? On the, the ACBL, no drain pan. On, the, on this one, the, uh, yeah. the LIU, the linear induction unit, uh, it does have a drain pan or a drip tray. Uh, the difference between those two options is a drip tray is designed for, um, you know, you're not designed to condense, but it may happen in your, in your area. Uh, so there's no there's no pipe going out to a condensate loop, whereas the drain pan would actually be piped to need a condensate pump and a full condensate loop outside of the beam. Um, so there's two different scenarios we can use. We can use a catch pan, essentially, we call it a drip tray, which is not piped outside of the beam, but the, we can also have a drain pan, which is piped outside of the beam. Do, do all the competitors have an A-frame? Uh, usually, uh, we don't see a lot of A-frames. There is a vertical coil option that we see, see in the market um, with, a, with two coils that are vertically uh, installed. And uh, we, we found uh, this works good enough for us. This is actually a test that we're trying to do to prove out the, uh, the A-frame style um, capacity, or A-frame -frame style water coil with the, uh, the drip tray below it. Uh, the concern that we had, we had seen expressed was that uh, the water was going to drop off and uh, it not catch in this drain pan. And we found that uh, we, we didn't see a single drop pass through. Um, so you can see there it's running down, sped up here, but uh, it is getting all caught by the drain pan. So then this, uh, this test here alleviated all of our concerns about, um, about those water droplets coming off early. Um, so I think uh, we're getting close to wrapping up here for this section, but uh, here's a few other options you have for condensing chilled beams. Um, as you can imagine, anything with a vertical coil is very easy to slap a drain pan on. So if you wanted to use those lower water temperatures, you can on the, the ACBC, the cabinet unit on the top left. The RAU is our induction unit. Uh, we replace all the carrier units with those that are older and it's time for a, a refreshed unit. And the ACBR also in the vertical orientation can use a drain pan as well. Um, the downsides of doing this is you probably have a little more maintenance on the water side, uh, making sure those drain pans aren't molding, um, also making sure the, the coil stays clean. Uh, you have to clean it more often because as a, if it's condensing, you have a lot of dust accumulating, it's going to be much harder to clean. Um, so those are the downsides, but the benefits are that you have more capacity per foot of water coil, um, so you can have a little more uh, energy out of your space. 
um, and you also may not need quite as much piping. And then also alleviates the concerns of opera windows and uh, doors to the outside. So uh, that's our final slide here. I guess we'll, we'll check and see if there's any questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nathan. We do have a few questions here. Uh, the first one's from Jason, and uh, this was asked before we started going over the chilled water loops and the different uh, ways in which we can produce a higher chilled water loop for the chilled beam systems. Uh, but I did want to address it uh, directly here. What types of systems are more typical to produce your higher chilled water temperatures for chilled beam? Mixing 40 three degree chilled water with return water or producing the higher temps directly with the chiller is one better than the other. Um, I, I think we did pretty well address that. And I think John actually in his presentation is gonna talk about this a little bit. Uh, but you know, one of the best ways that, that I see is, is pulling off your return water loop because that increases the delta T on your chiller which can increase the efficiency of the chiller. I don't know if anyone has anything to add to that. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, that would be my preference whenever possible, but uh, it kind of depends on what you're building and your budget is, how much control you want to have over each loop individually. Um, so there are a lot of, a lot of things to, to consider, but uh, in my opinion, the most energy efficient is going to be taken off the return, like you said. Great. Uh, next one is from AJ. Uh, what documentation do AHJs generally require to prove that the induction is consistent of consistently above ASHRAE 171? So we publish um, our induction ratios, and uh, you can see that in the selection of the software. So uh, we are that's part of the ASHRAE 200 method of testing. So we do test for that, and uh, the way we get that reading is we use a, a, a basically a grid of airflow velocity readings across the water coil. We'll take it uh, an inch by inch grid, and uh, that's how we measure the induction ratio uh, of the chilled beams. So it's uh, we don't test that in the field, but it is a, a characteristic we do use, uh, test for in our lab uh, before publishing our test data. Great, uh, a few more here. Uh, another question from uh, Jason. If you use a pressure independent control valve, can balance valves be eliminated if the PICV valves are serving a single beam? We might have to do some research on that one, Jason. Yeah, I agree. We can look into that and uh, get back to you on that one. John says you can do it. So <laughs> we'll we'll get back to you with a more formal answer. We'll 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 talk about it a little bit and get back to you, Jason. Thanks. Uh, AJ here says we've seen 5764 on chilled water systems. Is 5862 preferred even with higher flows? I think it just depends on. It really depends on what your application is. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. If your space temperatures are driving something for some specific application, then yeah. But other than that, I mean, you're. You're picking those temperatures for the performance of your beams, um, and if if that's all you have, then you know that's that's what you get to select your beams on. Um, yeah, there's a lot of efficiencies to kind of take a take a look at. Um, the beams themselves want a certain entering water temperature, and uh, so you, so you want to have. I, in my opinion, you want to have as cold a water as you can get away with, and stay as close to your dew point as you're you're able to achieve. Um, just because you want to reduce the amount of airflow that you need to treat that space, um, so I would I would lean towards trying to use a colder water temperature uh, and optimize for reducing fan energy, um, but that that could absolutely sacrifice on your your chiller side a little bit from the beams. Loop. Great. Well, thanks for the questions, everyone. Uh, lead into some pretty good conversation here, so we appreciate the input and uh, participation. And I think with that, I don't see any more questions coming in. We are going to take a quick 
10 minute break. So if you need to stretch your legs, grab some water, whatever, uh, go ahead and do that. And we will be back in 10 minutes at 2.50 to finish up the day with uh, John Swift. Thank you. So on the on the Mawasi something up something. Should we get now? No. Uh, on the wall.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, so presenting here now for uh, for the final session is uh, John Swift, principal and partner at Borough Happold. Uh, he's going to discuss some some lessons learned and and some applications that they've uh, used chilled beams in. And uh, I still encourage everyone to ask questions. We had a lot of great conversation in that last session as a result of your questions. So uh, please keep them coming and I'll pass it over to John to get going now. All right, can you hear me? All right, uh, greetings everyone. Um, hope you've enjoyed the uh, presentations and the seminar so far. Um, so really, I'm, I'm going to go over um, some uh, design approaches and some uh, case study examples of how we look at chill beam applications on uh, on projects. And a lot of the things that you, you all have been talking about and discussing today are taken into consideration in some of these discussions. So it's really kind of a lessons learned um, uh, presentation that I'm providing today. Um, so on every project, you know, we need to, you know, think about what options we want to consider for the HVAC system. And that's, you know, you want to understand, okay, what do you want to do with the central plant? What will your, what will your distribution strategies be? And then what type of terminal equipment will you use? And so on a lot of the larger projects that we work on, um, whether it's from a central uh, plant on a campus um, or just for the, the building itself, um, you know, we usually end up looking at a decoupled uh, hydronic solution um, when we're looking at the different aspects of the HVAC system. So the one in the middle is when, you know, once we see a system or once we start looking at, okay, hydronic makes the most sense for uh, this project for flexibility, for uh, energy efficiency, so on and so forth. And for many of the reasons that you talked about today, um, then that's when we will always consider chilled beams as one of the terminal unit solutions. It doesn't always end up that way, but um, any project where we start with a central chilled water and central heating plant, whether it's from boilers or more commonly now from heat pumps, and ground, whether it's ground source or air source, um, then we'll definitely look at chill beams along with fan coil units and, uh, and other um, terminal equipment. And I'll, I'll go through that as we go through, but it's, you know, kind of starts from that big picture perspective. And so why do we always consider chill beams? Well, there's a number of benefits. Um, and one is that, you know, in our calculations and also in, in the installations we've seen, well, we, we've been able to record actual energy uh, efficiency or energy usage, I should say. There's energy savings compared to almost every other application. Now, you know, everything I say here all depends on designing the system appropriately. And so, you know, it was brought up earlier when Nathan was presenting, you can certainly reduce the amount of ductwork on projects when you decouple the ventilation load that you need for the building with the sensible cooling load that you need for the building. And um, so there's certainly a significant reduced amount of ductwork and equipment size, um, uh, even on the, on the hydronic side because of the energy efficiencies that you're gaining. And then again, when designed and, and when using the right chill beam applications, there's a comfort and a maintenance uh, benefit. You know, every, Every time we design a project, and I have a slide further down, I, I feel like it should probably be right here. Um, but the first thing we think about is how people will feel in the space and how the space will be healthy and comfortable and an optimized interior environment to, to work in, to live in, to learn in. And so that's the first thing we really take into account when we're thinking about how to design systems. And then we apply mechanical engineering concepts to try to meet the goals of thermal comfort and uh, you know, increased ventilation and things like that. So when you're designing 
uh, a system and considering chill beams and chill beams have an air distribution component to it and you should be really looking at the chill beam and how it um, how it circulates air in the space the same way you would if you were designing an all air system you want to understand the airflow and the mixing and, and what the thermal gradients will be in the space whether there's going to be drafts and things like that so it's a really important concept that i'll get into a little bit more with, with some of the case studies we can talk about later um, and so I talked about this a little bit already, right? Uh, there's, when designed proper, properly, there is increased comfort um, and, and there should be in, in better acoustic values. Um, again, you have to pay attention to that, but certainly, you know, the old induction units that were, you know, that are no longer in favor, but really were the, you know, version one of chilled beams had, you know, many of them had acoustic issues that, you know, the, the Beams that we design today really don't have, and you know when you design a system with chilled beams, you, know, you do reduce the amount of filtration, you reduce the amount of electrical connections, and you can uh, you reduce the number of drain pans and condensate pumps uh, compared to like say fan coils for existence or for, for uh, instance. And so um, I heard the question earlier about MERV 13 filters on on uh, chill beams i i don't think that that's really the application that ashray is looking at i think that that mer 13 is about recirculated systems that have fans in them and not when you have induction in space you know we're not putting merv 13 filters on thin tube radiation for example right and so um i think that the right application actually i think that with chill beams and you'll see it a little further on in this presentation, we oftentimes will design to a higher percentage of outside air, which we think makes for a healthier space, but it doesn't mean that the air in the space is never, it only passes the breathing zone once. I mean, there's very few spaces that are like that. Um, so one of the big considerations is energy and, and the impact that energy usage has on carbon. There's a lot of discussion these days about net zero this and net zero that, net zero carbon, Net zero embodied carbon, all of these things, um, and you know the codes are being pushed uh, in in really aggressive ways now that you have to you have to optimize the design of the buildings, not in every aspect of the building. So, for example, um, I've heard uh, I was at a presentation years ago with a a colleague of mine, and we were presenting on a net zero energy building, and he said. Um, he said, you know, when you're designed to net zero, every BTU counts, which means like every every place you find to save energy, it all counts towards net zero. You have to, you know, find every BTU. And I really like that because, you know, somebody can say, well, you're only saving half a percent or something like that. But every, like, if you kind of get the zero carbon, um, then that, you know, every little bit counts. And then... The issue early that was discussed that I didn't, I don't think I brought up yesterday is if you have less ductwork, uh, maybe more piping, but if you have less ductwork on a project than smaller air handling systems, if the embodied carbon for that building is going to be less. I haven't done the, we haven't done the calculations, but we're working on that. We're actually very aggressively looking at understanding the embodied carbon impacts of, uh, of HVAC uh, design decisions. And so, um we're uh you know we're we're starting to consider that even in our design solutions is this is this little symbol that says you may be experiencing degraded audio is that you guys hearing me okay or how can you tell if you guys in the room are hearing me okay <laughs> if if somebody is online and they can't or they're having any issues, just let me know. I just had a, something just popped up. Yeah, they say they can't. Okay, sorry. I just, I got a pop up here and I want to make sure that it's, it's kind of weird presenting like this, but that's all right. It's the world we live in now. And Mark O'Brien, I don't want any comments from you. Um, so uh, anyway, so here's, here's one way that we, um, we uh, try to visually um, communicate the impacts of different uh, 
uh, ECMs, if you will, or different design component uh, uh, decisions to owners. And, and you know, the, the using active chill beams on a project is one of the you know, one of the most impactful things you can do, assuming you have the centralized system to deal with it, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, you know, we we see that our most energy efficient large buildings have chill beams as an option, not necessarily, and it doesn't mean that needs to be your only option. Some buildings it is, some buildings it isn't, but it certainly should be an option if you want to optimize the energy, uh, and especially in larger hydronic buildings where you have a the ventilation is decoupled. Um, and in some cases, with the with the newer, more aggressive energy codes, it can even push you over the edge of meeting a stretch code. You know, this is an ex actual example of an energy analysis that we did uh, in schematic design for a project. And you know, basically, we were like, you know, the the chill beam definitely get us to energy code, whereas the fan coils and the water source heat pumps were a little bit on the borderline there. Now that doesn't mean you can't get there with those units, right? But it does show that you know. There is an impact on that when, when you design the chill beams in an optimal way. Um, there is also, I'll talk about the air handling system design in a second, the dedicated outside air and what our considerations are. But one thing I do want to recognize is that when you have buildings, actually, I'm going to wait till I do the, the A88 um, Boylston uh, case study because I can talk about it in the context of that. But I just want to talk about fit out costs versus core and shell costs is it's a big issue on a lot of the projects that you know I'm sure a lot of you all work on and certainly the ones we work on. So a lot of our projects of that scale, and this is actually this is the selections that we used for A88 Boylston, which I'll talk to you more about in detail in a moment. Um, you know, we're really trying to um, drive down the uh, the wet bulb and dry bulb temperatures much lower than you would for a VAV system. So we're we're ending up with a, a second sensible wheel on almost all of these projects. Um, not so much the lab projects because we're not really using wheels on the lab projects, but certainly on the, uh, the office uh, projects. Um, and you know, in the in the cooling mode, we use the wheel, and, the, and then the heating mode, which is this next slide. You know, we bypass the wheel because it's just a static pressure loss that and we don't get any benefit out of it. Um, but it's it's what is important is that we optimize getting all the latent heat that we can out of the air handling, out of the air that's serving the chill beam system so that you're just dealing with sensible loads in the space for the most part. Um, and then, you know, when we're looking at Different options. Sometimes we'll, well, well, we'll definitely talk about. You know, the maximum flexibility would be is if you have a building, or if you have a tenant that comes in and their bias is towards heat pumps or towards fan coil units or towards having a combination of all of those things plus chill beams. Um, you know, we basically have an extra riser in those buildings. So we have a riser that's the you know the 42 to 44 degree chilled water supply riser, which Send to the fan coils if there are fan coils for certain areas of the building. Um, certainly to the air handling equipment, the large air handling equipment. That, that's the chill water, primary chill water supply temperature. And then we also have a condensed water loop that we generally will send down through the building. Um, sometimes for uh, mission critical loads, whether it's IT rooms or things like that, and sometimes for how retail um, uh, tenants will. Will be provided with, uh, uh, you know, the, the stub outs into their space, and they have to use condensed water and heat pumps to to deal with their space at the, you know, a lot of times at the podium of these buildings. But then, you know, we'll have a secondary riser, ideally, and certainly in all of the chill chill beam designs that we do, we'll have a, a riser that has the 50, 57 to 58 degree supply chill water supply temperature, um, and and we found that having this level of flexibility, especially in the higher end, class A office and, and lab spaces is, is desired. Um, the other thing that's coming up a lot, I'm sure you're all talking about is, is th this kind of shift from what was you know, kind of the standard design up until a couple of years ago to towards electrification of buildings because of the push for decarbonization and the 
and the um, and the cleaning of the grid, uh, you know, by legislation. That's how it's supposed to happen in states like Massachusetts. Um, and so, you know, chill beams are, you know, this doesn't really push you one way or the other away from or towards chill beams, but the point of this does say energy efficiency is really important as, as you look at the different types of applications for how you're going to go all electric in a building. And so, you know, this is a component that we have to look at now on every project. And, and a lot of our projects are either going all electric or they're going all electric ready. Uh, this is the slide I talked about earlier. You know, really the first thing you should think about is, is, is what it's going to feel like in the space and how it's going to uh, impact um, how you use the space. And then I know that you talked about earlier, and I think maybe Nathan talked about the different types of chill beams. So certainly there's different applications for different projects. And in the case studies, I'm going to show you the, the different applications that we've used just in, on, on a few different projects. Um, but there's certainly enough options now where you can really do some creative things in some of these buildings and optimize the system design. And you know the other thing that we're seeing a lot, and this is what I was going to bring this up, is um, you know there is there are some tenants that uh, that balk at the cost of fitouts for uh, with chill, with a chilled beam system, and so we're starting to see this DOAS fan powered box solution, which is basically a fan powered chilled beam, um, as a solution that's a little less expensive, um, and you know, we we saw it recently on a, a large project uh, in Seaport where this is being applied, and sometimes it's being applied, you know, along with chill beams, and that you know you select the right terminal unit for the you know for the right load. Um, but we're but it's interesting now that we're seeing this option in the marketplace quite a bit. Um, so speaking of the marketplace, I'm going to go through a few case studies here and then i'll take questions at the end i can't tell if there are questions or not can you guys tell me there's, there's one so far okay all right uh, this will probably be like five or ten more minutes and then we can take some questions so the first project i'm going to talk about is uh is uh, 888 boylston um the project uh had very high uh, sustainability aspirations it's a lead platinum building um and uh it was designed to have chill beams throughout. There was a lot of discussion about that early on, whether or not to design the building with chill beams. But in the end, um, that's how we designed the corn shell portion of the building. And we did a few fit outs in the, in the uh, building too. So I can show you how we applied our conceptual uh, corn shell fit out scenario. Um, the one thing that, one of the things to be very aware of when you're designing um, a system with chill beams is that, you know, it has a limitation from a load per square foot perspective, right? So if you have a space that has super high solar heat gain, which quite frankly, in the, with the energy codes now, it's going to be harder and harder to have space like that. But if you, you have to pay attention to the glazing uh, performance and if you're going to have high solar heat gain, and even though this building performs really well. We did post occupancy measurements on it for a year and it was it was performing even better than like the 44 uh, EUI that um, had been predicted. I think it was more around the 40 or 41 range, fully, you know, fully occupied. But the glazing, there there were certain areas of the building that had significant solar heat gain that we had to make sure that the chill beams could handle. So we did some CFD analysis before we did any of the tenant fit out designs. And so we can provide guidance even to other engineers that were working on some of the other fit outs on the in the building. And we we came up with a way to try to trap some of the, the um, solar heat that came into the space through a perforated shade pocket. So in this graphic on the right, it's a little bit hard to read, but the bottom line is that we we, we had uh, holes drilled in the shade pocket that was right against the wall, and so if you if you pulled that shade down, it would capture some of that solar heat, and it would radiate into the ceiling plenum and get treated back at the air handling unit. And we tried to calculate 
not super successfully, quite frankly, exactly what we were, you know, um, what we were bypassing and what what we were um, uh, doing to not have to have the chill beam deal with it. Um, I think in the end it was probably like a 20% to 25% benefit to for the chill beam sizing. Now you still had to treat this, right? It wasn't like you were saving energy by doing that, but you you were sending it back to the air and we're ready to deal with it instead of dealing with it in the space and having to have supersized chill beams or even heat pumps in some cases. Um, so this is a zoning diagram on the right of of the of a floor plate in the building. And you know, we designed the building, I think we ended up having maybe like 0.2 to 0.25 CFM per square foot. But you know, the chill beams when they, you know, when you had the solar heat gain, you really needed more like 0.35 CFM per square foot. The good news is because of the orientation of the building, you know, the blue is the is east, so north is up on is in the top of the plan as uh, you know you would usually expect. And so, you know, the blue the blue part of the building got a lot of sun in the in the morning. The green part got a lot in the uh, you know in the late morning and early afternoon, but also in the in the winter, right? As the sun is lower in the sky. And then the red part got a lot of a lot of solar heat gain in the afternoon. A significant part to where we almost couldn't make chill beams work, but with that shade pocket idea, um, and with being able to boost up the the flow to you know to 0.35 CFM on the you know wherever you had a load, which was basically drive driven by solar, uh, we were able to make that work. And even in that case, you can see the the blow up on the left, the orange box. You know, we had like. 10 feet of chilled beam in a in a corner office you know and and that was on the west facade and so you know that's a lot of chill beam for a small office space and so it's you know it was important for us to make sure that this was going to work it did work you know we did we did the right level of analysis but you do have to be careful with that and then the other key is you need to be able to turn it down if you you know, so if you're on that blue side of the building and it's three o'clock in the afternoon, if you're delivering 0.35 CFM a square foot um, through your chilled beams, there's a good chance that you could subcool the space. And so, you know, being able to turn it up and turn it down. And so very rarely do we do the, any of these chilled beam systems. I, I've done, I've seen one, not done one, but I've seen one in the past where it's a constant volume system in a building that has varying loads and it, it doesn't work very well. So I, I strongly encourage you to, you know, when you're designing something like this, you can do it, you know, the, the zones can be, the air zones can be fairly large. Um, and so, you know, on this floor, we might have like, I don't know, maybe 10 VAV boxes, maybe 12. But if you had done it all with all VAVs, you probably would have, you know, four times that. But you need a way to turn down the air, in my opinion, on these projects. and and this building worked great with with that concept um, I, another completely different project but with even more analysis was our project down in Pittsburgh that we did for PNC the PNC Bank this is called the PNC Tower designed by Gensler uh, it was Gensler, Gensler's Boston office did you know, most of the design and this you know this had some very lofty uh, sustainability goals. Um, once it was built and, and commissioned, it's actually the largest naturally ventilated tower in, in the United States. And I think maybe the second largest in North America. And to make that work, there was a lot of engineering that went into it. Um, we did CFD analysis to see how the solar uh, chimney would impact uh, air, natural ventilation flow through the building as we opened up the facade. Um, and then there were really kind of three elements to that design process. There was a lot of design and analysis using all types of technologies, including computation and simulation. And then we did mock-ups. And there are projects, when you're getting into projects that have this type of um, innovative uh, approach, it's important to do mock-ups to make sure that your simulations are actually going to happen in the, in the real physical environment. 
Um, and so we analyzed a lot. You know, there's a there's a solar ventilated cavity in natural ventilation that you know the the shape of the building was actually driven by some of the engineering calculations, which is unusual. Um, it has dynamic facades that open and close depending on the time of year. It has and it has uh, passive chill beams to do radiant cooling, um, and 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 that supplements the displacement ventilation uh, in the building. Very very interesting project. I wasn't the engineer on this, but I've I've talked to our engineers that did it and I've seen enough presentations. It's really 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 interesting, innovative. And so there's a few different modes of operation, obviously, um, but in in the mechanical cooling mode and in the mechanical heating mode we're using passive chill beams so no, there's no air to those but they're you know there's you're just basically using induction in the space to um to be able to condition the temperature in the space and this is just another sketch of kind of how it was all set up in the building with the doas system and the passive chill beams and that and um uh, and then we actually took it um, to price and we we had it mocked up and we made sure that it was going to operate the way that we um, intended it to. Um, I had another project, I, I mentioned this yesterday, where I had a lab project where we were trying to do chill beams and the, the load in the space was a little higher than the, than what we usually saw so we wanted to place the chill beams closer to each other and we actually first we did a cfd analysis um, and then we mocked it up uh, up in winnipeg with price to make sure that we weren't getting um, the, the distribution coming out of the chill beams wasn't going to crash into it like the air flows weren't going to crash into each other and and cause downdrafts and in doing that mock-up we even tweaked the chill beam in the field and put a, a manual damper on it to be able to adjust the throw patterns of the chill beam. So when you're doing something, I mean, you know, a lot of times you can do it based on just what you get out of the catalog data, but there are times when mock-ups are necessary if you're trying to do something uh, something new and, or if you see something that you're concerned about, but the project, you still think it's the best for the project to, to follow through with that application. So I highly encourage it when you can do it. And then this last uh, one here is just I, the reason I show this one is it's a project that we, we designed out at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And this project actually has passive chill beams that are uh, at the floor level. So it's, it's almost and it's in it's in um, uh, it's coordinated and integrated with a, uh, a displacement ventilation system. So the passive chill beams in this case almost look like thin tube radiation. Um, and the space is super comfortable, very, uh, uh, very acoustically um, acceptable. Like there's a sound masking system. It's it's a very pleasant place um, to be. So it's a it's a successful project, and the chill beam application there was an important part of that. And I think that's all of my uh, slides. So I'll open it up to questions. You see the questions? Can I see them? Uh, you might be able to. Yeah. Um, thanks, Sean. Uh, we do have a question here, and I I think you may have addressed this a little bit in talking about 888 Boylston. Um, but the question comes from Jason, uh, and he says, should chilled beams only be used in tight construction, where infiltration of humidity is a low risk? I would say yes. I mean, if you You'd have, it'd be very unusual to have a project where you're applying chill beams that the, the building is that um, leaky. Like I, I guess it's a, it's a good question though. I guess on certain projects, if you have an existing building that you're working on, you could, you could have a building that had such a poor envelope that it, it could be an issue. Um, but I tend to think that that would have to be a pretty leaky building. Yeah, and I think that's really the question: is you know, if it is leaky, um, you got other issues. You got other issues. Exactly. Yeah, chill beams aren't the solution. Insulation <laughs> is the solution. 
So I have uh, been victim of that. And uh, one other place that I would look to is your leakage above the saline. Um, I've seen applications where it's really humid above the saline, but it's very dry below the saline. And the beams and the beam piping yeah. have the possibility of uh, sweating above the saline. So, yeah, I mean, great I, question. That goes, yeah, it is a good question. I think that goes back to kind of like you have to think holistically with systems to design energy efficient buildings and if you have buildings that have those types of uh, i'll call them failures then that needs to get addressed no matter what type of system you're going to have yeah. because you'll have mold above that ceiling right and you'll yeah. have and you'll have energy losses and so you definitely like if if that if you have that issue on a building even if you're you know the mechanical engineer you should say we have an envelope issue like how like that. how are we going to fix it or you know, they'll say we can't. You know, we can't. And then he might say, "Okay, well, what's the cheapest HVAC system we can use? Because we shouldn't be doing anything super special. Because this is not the. You know, you want to just do something here that you can hopefully make it through the next five years or something, right?" Yep. Great question. Yeah, good question. There's a lot of factors at play there for sure. Uh, we, uh, I don't see any other questions here. Um, well, just as I say that, another one comes in from Mitchell. Uh, when sizing a chilled beam for the maximum flow rates due to demand control ventilation, what considerations need to be taken to ensure the minimum ventilation rate is able to meet the heating load? So I guess this would be a, be a situation for both heating and cooling from the beam. Man. Yeah. So every now and then we run into a scenario that where the length of the beam is actually driven by the uh, the heating load, uh, especially in northern climates. Uh, sometimes you have more coil than you need for cooling, but heating is actually you're not meeting that. Um, so that absolutely can drive the length of the coil. You have to add the best way to get more heat out of the coil uh, or out of the beam itself is to increase the length of coil. Um, so that can drive your length really. Uh, but your question, I think, is about uh, meeting those at, uh, at minimum ventilation. And uh, oftentimes, you may not actually be at minimum ventilation. You could be a sensibly driven space where the airflows are higher. Uh, so you're going to size those airflows to, to be as optimized as possible for cooling while also able to meet the heating, um, which means you actually may be lower on CFM, but you have to have a longer beam than you might expect uh, because that heating load drove, drove, uh, drove that length up. So interesting question. There's definitely a balance between those three, ventilation, cooling, and heating. Um, and uh, each can definitely play a role. Yeah, and I, actually, I, somebody asked a COVID question earlier. I, one of the things that we're doing on most projects now is we're um, on all projects is that we have air quality monitoring, which obviously is CO2 sensor, but other. I mean, you you really want to make sure that you're delivering minimum ventilation to the space. I mean, that's that's key. So um, yeah, you're using the CO2 control level. Though inside limiting there could drop you below the minimum ventilation rate. Yeah, but I'm talking about it the other way. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, I'm okay. saying you can only go so low. Okay. And then if it allows you to go lower, don't don't, go don't allow it. Yep. Because I think, I mean, you know, there's always an, an, a but, right? Yeah. The but is like if there's, you know, it's a, the floor can handle 200 people and there's five people there. Right, like there has been for the past year and a half. Right, in unoccupied mode, then, then it's a different. But then, yeah. I mean, you know, you just, you, know, you make adjustments based on those kind of special circumstances. Good question. It says my battery is running low. So. Yeah, great question. Great question. Um, I do not see any other questions here. Uh, I I want to take a moment to to thank you, John, for being here with us and and uh, presenting uh, some of the stuff that you've been working on and and your design approach to these types of buildings. I'd like to thank uh, the team at Price that has helped us to put this on. And uh, last, just thank everyone on the line here that's joined us for the day. Uh, you know, it's a long day. And uh, we really hope that you got something out of it. There was a lot of good conversation this afternoon. So that tells me that people are engaged, they're interested. 
Um, as I said, we did cover a lot of topics today. If you're, uh, you know, hanging around this afternoon and, and you're thinking about this stuff, or, uh, you know, if you're like me, you probably want to forget about it for the day. Um, but if you are thinking about it, some questions pop up, please reach out. Um, please reach out to myself, reach out to your Buckley contact. Uh, if you don't know who that is, you're, you're more than welcome to, to reach out to me and I will get you in contact with the right person or uh, probably talk to you myself. So uh, with that, I'd like to again, thank everyone and uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Okay, thank you. Good job, guys. All right. Yeah, yeah. good job. Yeah, yeah.